this one. Uh, what? <laughs> check, check, check. <laughs> hein? En tout cas, le, ils ne mettent, ma... mettent pas en marche le micro-pavillon. Ah bon ah non, si. non, mais enfin, ils ne voulaient pas qu'on parle tellement de... Bon, peu importe. Oh, bah, je peux m'asseoir, je peux me mettre debout. Ouais, voilà. Assis, ah, si, debout, couché. <rire> so, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, I'm Romain Poivet. Uh, I lead, uh, I'm the engagement lead at the World Benchmarking, engagement, uh, World Benchmarking Alliance <laughs> on the climate and energy topic. And I'm so honored to uh, introduce this side event on planning uh, the transition. It's now obvious for uh, everyone that transition plans are critical for the transition. I mean decarbonization and more globally, ecological transition. Since COP26, finally, I mean really finally, transition plan is a buzzword everywhere, such as accountability as well. Uh, The ACT initiative, the Assessing Low Carbon Transition Initiative launch at COP21 was exactly created for that, to create a, a climate and accountability framework for organization. And we have been talking so much about transition plans since COP21, and now finally the whole climate network recognized the concept as essential and critical to the achievement of the Paris Agreement goals. So it's critical now for government and non-state non -state actors to set and implement transition plans. <laughs> the question now is how to connect the dots between uh, the different levels of transition plans for, from NDCs, so from national level uh, to companies level and financial institution level. <laughs> and even local authorities level, because it's also uh, critical to onboard all the local authorities in the transition. So that's exactly the purpose of this uh, side event. So let me invite uh, Yann Briand from IDRI, uh, l'Institut du Développement Durable de la Recherche Internationale, uh, followed by uh, Louise Kessler. She will join in line. Yeah, Louise, are you there? You are there, thanks. Brilliant. So, Louise from the uh, I4CE, I4CE, en bon français. <laughs> And uh, so, they will start to uh, tell a little bit more about transition plan at national level and how it will uh, uh, support the indices of, of governments. And then they will be followed by uh, Anatole Metegrolier, who leads uh, the Act for Finance Methodology Development, and Elsa Shoni, uh, which is in charge of sectoral transition plans. They are both working for the French State Agency of Ecological Transition, ADEM. And they will both tell you a bit more about how to connect and how should be an effective transition plan at companies level, whatever we are talking about, uh, financial institution level or non-financial institution level. And because we also need to, it's important to also embed it on board, sorry, uh, all the industry, uh, all the EV industry in the decarbonization. So now I shut my mouth and I'm <laughs> inviting you to present your uh, Uh, introduction, uh, Yann. No. Sorry for that. Thank you. So now it, sh it should work. Um, so I will, I will present a few slides uh, about an experimentation that we, we have done actually uh, with the ACT initiative. And if, I don't know where... What? Like this? Mm. Okay, so I, I don't know if I can go back. No, I can't. Okay, so now. I will, I will then show you if you can pass the slide, so yeah. So next one, please. So just. Okay, so. Uh, 
So just starting with a word about the, the deep decarbonization initiative. So where I come from and why I'm talking today uh, about this, uh, this topic. So I'm part of the deep decarbonization initiative, which is an initiative that has been launched by uh, IDWI uh, back from, uh, let's say, 2014, with a group of researchers in all the different parts of the world that you can see on the, on the map on the right side. So the role of the deep decarbonization initiative is actually to develop bottom-up and country-specific analyses and pathways to deep decarbonization that are taking into account the different national circumstances. So I'm really happy, by the way, to have one of my colleague, uh, Emilio, that is uh, here and that will be there after at, uh, at the panel to also uh, uh, bring his experience of, of working with us on, uh, on, the, on that issues. And we develop deep decarbonization scenario also as a tool to facilitate the dialogue between the different national actors. We believe that we are talking about company transition plans, national transition plans, there are different words. We call it pathways, deep decarbonization pathways. But that's the same idea in a way, is to explain how we reach uh, the, the long-term goal of the Paris Agreement at the different national level. And we are an international community of practitioners, modelers, experts that develop these analyses. What I will now tell you is that the initiative, so that's where I come from, we have decided it was three years ago to make a partnership with the ACT initiative that Romain just introduced, which is working on the assessment of company transition plans and to make a joint project in Latin America, in Brazil and in Mexico, to test a common approach and develop a common methodology that would test how we could facilitate the dialogue between the private sector and the national actors. And I will now in two slides present you some of the main lessons. So if you can go to the next slides, please. So first lessons from this ACT DDP project is about the, the company assessment. And I think, so DIG's experimentation was covering, let's say, it, it was a small sample. It, it was covering only 10 companies in Brazil and 10 companies in Mexico. But the idea was to test the appetite of Brazilian companies and Mexican companies in working on company transition plans and discussing how this is aligned with national deep decarbonization pathways. So first uh, lessons of this project is that clearly, and I think it's going in the same direction than the, the overall uh, let's say assessment and CDP has done and so on, is that most companies today do not have a consistent low carbon strategy and transition plans to account their commitments. So they have their commitments, but in the case when we try to assess how they are going there, they are not able to provide enough uh, details about it. The second point is that clearly it was difficult to access some public information and that w w it was it is one of the main challenge when doing this such exercise is to access to the, the, the different data, the different report, the different information where we could base our assessment. So clearly, this is one of the first uh, second issue is that in both countries, most of the, the companies have not disclosed publicly essential information for the assessment. Third, is that we tested through the ACT initiative, so the framework that has been developed and is looking at different, different characteristics of the company transition plans, and clearly it was too ambitious in many cases, which means that in many cases we have not been able in uh, some, of the, uh, some of the modules or some of the, the indicators we wanted to assess to have enough detail, so which makes that uh, in some way, we need to recognize that the assessment on some of the indicators were not based enough on uh, relevant details. So it was more uh, than a discussion assessment with the company to try to understand uh, in which direction they are going. And uh, we think it's a challenge because the ACT initiative is working a lot with uh, the different standards, uh, international standards that are in development currently, and most of the indicators that they are using are potentially ones that will be taken over by these international standards. So which means that currently, the companies, the, so, the small sample we have uh, assessed is not able to provide at this stage the relevant indicators that potentially these international standards will ask in a few years. 
And uh, last point that is, let's say, the however, <laughs> the positive point, is that we have uh, recognized that the company were really key to engage the discussion with us, with uh, the deep decarbonization initiative on the national transition. So they were keen to participate to the dialogue with r academics from their country, with NGOs from their country to try to understand what are the different visions and how we go there in the different sectors. So that's the, that's the last point. Clearly, they were quite happy that we organized several public events, several also closed events for some discussions. Uh, but to have this capacity to exchange with national experts. And if you want to learn more on the, the assessment, these are public on the website, so the agddp.org, that all you can find uh, assessment for the different sectors in these two countries. Next slide, please. And to finish, uh, these are the lessons for the national and uh, international climate agenda. So. The last slide was really about the, the company assessment. This one is about the, how we enable the, the, the consistency, let's say, of these company transition plans with the national commitments and national pathways. So first uh, lessons is that clearly, if we want to go further into this uh, analysis of the consistency of, na of company transition plans with national pathways, we need to go beyond the emission targets. And we need to be able to talk about the different aspects of the transition, meaning starting by looking at the different sectors, then entering on the production side, demand side, and, and having a level of granularity that enables really the discussion on concrete points and avoid having overall conversation on, yeah, this is what we want to achieve, you know, this is where we go in general, these are the main actions. No, we need clearly to discuss the content of the sexual transformations in the broader national perspective to discuss then what is the role of the companies in it. I will come back to this point later. The second lesson is that clearly I think we, we are quite happy of the achievement of using these two tools, because it's tools. I mean, developing pathways, national pathways, and doing company assessment are uh, tools that we have used actually to frame uh, discussions with companies and national actors. And clearly, as one of the results of the project, because we have done several workshops there, it has proven to be effective in the way it facilitated some discussions about the capex investment for some companies or it facilitated the regulatory uh, understanding of what will happen in this country in their sector so it, it has proven to be effective uh, but maybe again and it's linked to the first one to be able to reach this discussion about the capex investment just to take this example we need to be able to describe what, what, what are the capex we are talking about? So we, are, we need to discuss in the different sectors the production assets that we are talking about. We need to have the national vision of what is the need, for example, of the production asset to then realize what this company can do in the transition for the, within the whole country transition. And to finish, I think two lessons of, let's say, uh, segmenting the conversation or uh, ensuring that we are not missing the, the, let's say, the big picture. And we are not lost in you know, small discussion about technical efficiency or whatever. Clearly, what is of interest in such dialogue is to discuss the long-term vision of the transformation of their business model. We are not talking about, I mean, we talk a bit about, OK, these are the existing assets and how you can make some efficiency improvement in your assets. But this is not the biggest problem. The biggest problem are to talk about, OK, how you potentially phase out some of your assets. What are the next one that you should invest in? And framing the conversation by providing a national vision of this is the future by 2050, so long-term investment in, in 30 years. This is where we need to go. And having a description of in the power sector, in the cement sector, these are the type of carbon intensity of the production assets you need to have and so on. Then push them also to react to that and explain based on their assets and what they disclose to us, what's going to happen to the ones that are the most dirtiest, <laughs> and so on. So this, this discussion on the future of production assets and business model is clearly 
something we should not miss that is potentially the most difficult one to have in terms of discussion with the company. But I think if we miss it, we miss the interest of the exercise. And second point is beyond their own assets. So the question of the value chain in general and the supply chain, so more related to the scope three emissions. This is clearly, uh, I think, uh, what also the national pathway can provide. In the national pathway, we are, we ha we are having an economy-wide pathway. So looking at all the different sectoral transition. So we provide a picture about the transport and logistic transformation. We provide a picture of the energy system transformation and not, for example, only a about the cement production. So for a cement producer, this is important to have in mind, for example, the, the cross-sectoral challenges and how, what are the challenges of the energy systems, what are the challenges also of the transport and logistic systems. And uh, this is what the national pathway can provide and facilitate as a conversation with them to discuss their relation after that with, of course, their subcontractors. Uh, for energy, for transport, but also to discuss sometimes some changes required from uh, their client behaviors. So I feel that this is uh, two main learnings of uh, how to use effectively national deep decarbonization pathways to engage the conversation with, uh, with companies uh, in, different, in different countries. Thank you. And, and then again, the website, if you want to learn more about this experimentation about Brazil and Mexico, because we have produced also national pathways in these two countries that are accessible on the website. Please, you're welcome. And thank you. Thank you, Jan. Thanks a lot. And now I will invite uh, Luis Kessler from uh, I4C. Luis, can you hear us? In two minutes. Okay, so in this case, um, yeah, as we are running late, I would uh, invite Elsa, to, because I think that your presentation on on how to connect the uh, EV industry transition plans is really the next more logic um, presentation. Uh, okay, can you hear me? Perfect. Uh, so I don't have the little thing to change the slides, so sorry. If you could move to my slides, or I can do it. Again. Again, I think it's even further. Well, not, not too quick. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Jan, for your really insightful um, uh, presentation. I think we have to, to discuss afterwards. Um, so as you mentioned, sectoral uh, transition is also an, a really important question. We are always talking about the sector specificities. They are always saying that I'm not like my neighbor. I don't have the same problems. So we really need to go in the details to really help them transition. Um, we're always talking about industry when we talk about transition, or at least often. In fact, that's quite a big part of the cake uh, in France, for example. Um, so I will be not, I won't be talking um, about international problems. So that's just uh, an initiative that we launched three years ago in France. Um, so in France, Industry, it's around 20% 20 20 of the GHG emissions. That's about the same in the, the global emission. Our low carbon national strategy sets, uh, has set an objective for uh, to 2050 of n carbon neutrality. Uh, and then this objective has been declined for macro, sector, macro sectors like transport, building, and industry. And concerning industry, the objective is to reduce by 81% the GHG emissions of the sector. That's huge. So we've got a big part of the cake and a huge objective. The problem is the low carbon strategy doesn't yet um, provide a clear pathway to how, how are we going to reach that ambitious objective? That's why, and okay, that works. 
um, and it also doesn't provide any sectoral clear pathways. So we wanted to fill a bit the gap in France concerning a few sectors because I was talking about the 20% of the GHG emissions, but if you look a bit closer uh, with around, let's say, 10 or 9 sectors, you cover two-thirds of the emissions. So it's a really good starting point. So it's what we call the heavy industry. So you've got the, the sectors here. I'll go back into the details. So three years ago, we started working on those nine um, sectors and building with them, because it's an important part of the work. We really do a uh, consultation with them. We started building sectoral transition plans. So we're talking about plans, you're talking about pathways. That's another question. Uh, th those are different terms that we need to to clear a bit, but uh, the idea is the same as you said. Um, so the cement uh, sectoral transition plans has always been published a year ago, and others are coming really soon. Um, so I'll go back into uh, the method uh, right after. But just so you know, a quick step aside, we are also launching in January uh, standardization work on how to build a clear, ambitious, credible, and operational uh, transition plans. So I've heard here in the COP a lot, a lot of initiatives on the same problematics. That's really great. We, we really need to, uh, to work together with different uh, paradigms. But at the end, the users of those initiatives are a bit lost because there are too much of them, too many of them. And we need sometimes just to, you know, to, to clear a bit the path and to choose a method together to, let's say, to, to go forward. So we don't want the standardization work at the European level, precise. We don't want it to, well, we don't want to promote only our method. The idea, I'm sorry, we've heard that a lot recently. We just need to gather all the experiences about around road mapping exercise together and just to agree on a method just so that the next road maps can be uh, can be compared and can be used together because for now on it wasn't possible. So a uh, quick, uh, quick advertisement, if you want to join our working group, you're really welcome, we're looking for as much as many stakeholders as we can, as we can gather. So that's what. So about the method, um, and I'll be uh, five minutes, that's it. Um, so there are, as I said, there are a lot of road mapping exercises uh, that has been produced already. Some of them are really focused on technological aspects. What uh, decarbonization levels do we need to implement to reach those objectives? It's really insightful and really important job to do. But at the end, uh, the industrial actors are not making decisions only on technological aspects. On the other side, we've also got a lot of uh, economical road mapping exercises. So how much will it cost? This is also quite a big, quite a big question. But the two, again, are working together, and the decision making is a complex pr uh, process. So what we wanted to do wasn't to add another, another road mapping exercise just for fun. We wanted to have a 360 degree vision of what industry transition could mean. So we tried to put everything in the exercise. Maybe it's not 360 degree, but I think we covered a quite wide part. And when we talk about industry, well, industrial doesn't produce just for fun. They produce because there is a demand. And if you don't look at the demand, if you don't consider all the environment uh, around their decision making, so clearly the market and the demand side, you're completely disconnected from reality. And we wanted those exercises to be useful, operational, and realistic. That's why we worked with them. So the third vision of our work is trying to, well, not, not predict. Let's uh, stay honest. But just to try to project ourselves in different scenarios where the market evolves differently. Uh, concerning the cement uh, sectoral transition plans, for example, we've got two scenarios where one uh, where the society really gets sober in the right way, um, and we don't build houses 
in uh, anymore in 2050, or only a few. So that's a huge um, earthquake in the sector because if you don't build houses, you don't need cement anymore. So the decision making will be completely different in what assets are we investing. The answer will be completely different. And in the other scenario, we had a technological bet, let's say, um, at the cement as uh, emission process, um, process emissions. We, of course, looked at the CCUS and particularly CCS um, solution to the carbon capture and storage. And in that scenario, we pushed a bit for that level. So the idea here is just to invite the sector to protect themselves in completely, dif completely different worlds so that they can be resilient and, let's say, um, uh, think more about their investment and the path they want to take. So at the end, we, we land on a public and private action plan. So it's not actions that we are going to implement. But that's actions that can be solution, or at least part of the solution, uh, to the obstacles that we identified and that need to be overcome for the sector to, trans to effectively transition. So yeah, uh, so we're on a French perimeter, uh, of course, and the sectors uh, are mentioned here: so steel, aluminium, cement, um, sugar, pulp and paper, ammonia, ethylene, and chlorine. And um, as we are uh, going through all those uh, plans, we really see that we, we cannot talk about industry transition. It's really uh, a sector and even sometimes a company question. You can look, you can look at it only on the, global, on the global aspects. So we really need to get deeper and to have sectoral tools, because you talked about tools. For the, for the companies, for the sectors, but also for the public uh, institutions to use to build national plans or national strategy. And that's it for me. I think that's your turn. <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot, Elsa. Uh, if we are now the reconnection with Ruiz, can you hear us? Yes. Perfect. Ruiz, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I'm very glad to be part of this uh, side event on, on planning for the transition. Uh, I think I had a couple of slides. I don't know if you're able to, to put them on the screen. So just before I was disconnected, uh, Jan was mentioning that several countries have engaged in deep decarbonization pathways in the DDP project, and and we can also and and we have also several countries engaging who have developed long-term strategies. So, so, as of today, thank you very much. As of today, um, 55 countries have submitted their long-term strategies to the UNFCCC. Next slide, please. And the question now really is how to go from uh, these national decarbonization strategies, pathways to their implementation and so that the economy is transformed to a low carbon and resilient economy. And we argue, next slide please, that a first step to achieve this implementation is to develop a public finance strategy for the transition. So actually, this may sound like a, a bit of a restricted scope, but um, but a public finance strategy would cover uh, these three components. So a first component, a first block would be around investments. So what are the projected changes in the real economy, how these translate into investment needs. There would be a second block about uh, public action. So what should, what, what, what shape should take public action, which incentives should be put in place. And there would be a third block on the macro economic implications of the transition. So next slide, please. Uh, I'll briefly present each of these blocks. So the first, the first block on investments is based on the, on the observation that a country's uh, greenhouse gas emissions are directly linked to the type of equipment and infrastructure on the ground, which means that the transition to a low carbon and resilient economy will uh, materialize in visible uh, real economy investments. So this means we will see more electric vehicles on the roads, and we'll have um, clean energy um, power production, we'll have also like uh, buildings being um, efficiently renovated, and all these can be translated into investments. So here we see um, in, in the two graphs at the bottom, uh, this is a, a work in, into which we engage 
annually at I4C is um, is looking assessing all the climate investments taking place in France, both public and private, every year. So you see on the left the climate friendly investments, and on the right uh, climate harmful investments, or basically investments that support the consumption and the production of fossil fuel. Next slide, please. But what really matters about these investments is really investment needs, right? So here it's um, understanding how much how much of the investment effort uh, needs to be delivered in order to, to to reach the climate objectives. And here it's again something that we publish every year. So it's comparing uh, the current level of, of climate investments in the country. So in France here, this is what you see in the blue column on the left, with investment needs assessments based on different decarbonization pathways. So the first one is based on the official. Um, uh, roadmap, uh, Francis roadmap, which is called Stratégie Nationale de Carbone, SNBC. And the four others are based on scenarios which were provided by ADEM. And all these, these five scenarios um, reach zero net emissions in 2050. And here, so the purpose of this assessment is to look at the investment gap. So how much, uh, what is, how much investment need to be unlocked in France? Um, I think this is for the time horizon 2030, by 2030. Next slide, please. So here we move to the second block. So how do we unlock these investments? Um, and really, so the second block is about public action, and it's about specifically estimating the implications of the national decarbonization strategy for the national budget. So first of all, it's about uh, designing, implementing the right public policies and incentives in order to trigger the required investments. So here it touches upon questions of uh, policy design and policy evaluation uh, to be sure that these you know, policy uh, achieve um, emission targets. A second one is then looking at uh, the implication of these policies for on government budget. So what is the public spending that is needed to implement these policies? So this is in terms of projected expenditure, what is the funding gap? And here tools uh, like the green budgeting can be quite helpful to understand what is currently being spent by the government uh, for climate friendly activities and what is also being spent for climate harmful activities. And then finally, um, in, in this public action block, you have the question of what are the sources of revenues which could be mobilized. So for instance, this would mean looking at, at current tax revenue, environmental tax revenues, um, sustainable finance instruments, potentially green bonds, but also looking at how you could reform fossil fuel subsidies uh, in order to, to, to reorient a government spending towards um, climate friendly activities. Next slide, please. And the final block is really about is, is looking at the macroeconomic implication of the transition. And because the, the shifts, the scale of the shifts which are required in order to, to reach the target uh, means that there will be significant impacts on the structure of the economy. And so and, and there is evidence in the literature that the following macroeconomic indicators could be affected by the transition. So it could be output in terms of gross rates, but also income levels, product poverty rates or inequality indicators. Uh, there could be implications on employment with um, shifts of employment uh, across sectors. It could also have um, uh, implications on prices, so energy prices, uh, food prices as well, implications on debt levels, on the trade balance if your if the nature, the volumes and the and the prices of your of your exports and imports change, and also uh, implications on foreign exchange. Next slide please. So um, concretely, how could we implement uh, this um, such a public, public, um, public finance strategy for the transition? So um, I've mentioned before that we need to have a plan. So another thing which is crucial is that because it needs to be very comprehensive, like a, a whole of government approach, it needs to be piloted at the prime minister level. And of course, it should be um, it would be a, um, and the, the person in charge or the the, um, the team in charge of this this public finance strategy should be accountable to the parliament. So we can see here that France is going in the right direction with um, the new Secretariat General à la Planification Écologique, which is uh, directly attached to the prime minister. Another crucial point is putting in place a public finance programming. And this, um, you, so this is a point that was raised before by, by Romain, Elsa and Jan. It's, it's crucial in order to have visibility for all economic actors on what will be the, the, the public action over the coming years uh, in the in the short to medium term, and this will also ensure um, the safeguarding of public finance for the transition, in order to avoid that the, when there are crises, such as the COVID crisis, energy crisis, that uh, public spending is redirected towards um, towards uh, rescue plans um, instead of uh, instead of um, financing climate action. And the final point is around preparedness and foresight. And of course, um, there will be setbacks. Uh, and this is why it's, it's very important to have this, uh, this long-term vision also of the, of the, of the implications for, for public finance. That's it. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thanks a lot, Louise. And uh, now I will introduce Anatole Metegorli to speak about how to finally connect that yeah. with the financial institutions. Thank you, Romain. Uh, so yes, notably, I'm going to talk about transition plan. Uh, as Romain said, it's quite a buzzword. I would say it's a key concept uh, today for corporate, governance, or uh, financial institutions to actually um, decarbonize and, of course, uh, manage their uh, commitments. So here you can see the seven key components for transition plan. This work is actually based on our works. Uh, so basically sectoral decarbonization plan uh, already presented by ELSA, but also the ACT initiative uh, that I will give uh, further detail on. So the seven key components that we uh, have identified to ha that we have sorry identified to date. The first one is the business model strategy and governance. So basically here we are talking about how the, comp the, the company, the financial institution or the government uh, actually manage its transition. Notably, here it's an important point, in link uh, with the regulation existing. So basically in Europe, uh, if you are a company, your uh, transition plan should actually fit with what is done at the EU level. Uh, in details, we look at several uh, criteria, for instance, we, we ask several criteria such as remuneration, uh, climate change management uh, at the board, uh, stress testing, so this way also we talk about internal carbon price. The second big element here is about targets, so this is actually the first step for me. Uh, it's about having science-based targets. Uh, this is the first uh, key step to start your journey. Um, and of course, you have to, to have inter, inter, intermediate steps in order to have a credible uh, journey. Uh, this should include, of course, direct and, and significant indirect emissions. So this is according, for instance, uh, ISO norm 14064 uh, uh, part one and scope one, two, three, following the GAG protocol. We also, of course, ask for performance measurement. This is key to assess performance. So based on the same scope, uh, so the same boundary, so relevant, direct, and, and uh, indirect significant emission. I think this point is quite uh, important. Then we ask for action and resources. What are the financial resources, of course, tied to it? Tied to it. And the uh, important point, of course, uh, the, supply, the supplier and client engagement. So basically the engagement along all the value chain. Uh, to give some uh, yes, tangible exa example, it's about, for instance, incentivizing, rewarding your supplier to set themselves science-based target, to promote a code of, a code of conduct in a, uh, about a GHG mission, for instance. Uh, but, well, there are a lot of best practice in, in the market that uh, can be used here. Then we also ask, of course, elements about GLG removal and offsets. Uh, it's part of, also of the strategy to capture the remaining uh, carbon emission uh, remaining to, in order to fully contribute to the, neutral, uh, to the carbon neutrality. And of course, uh, monitoring, reporting, and verification process, which is key to track and assess uh, this uh, element. So this was actually the key elements. They are also, of course, uh, actually visible in lots of different standards. Uh, very credible ones, such as FRAG, ISSB, TPT, TCFD, and ECC. Sorry for the acronym. Um, so yes, basically, they ask to include transparency on GHG emission. I think we all, are, uh, we all agree on that. Lit a little focus on the EU sustainability reporting standard. Uh, so the SRS, uh, the first publication will be in, uh, in 2025. Uh, they will, the offset will be considered, but not as a lever. So it's part of the disclosure, but it does not have to be the core, uh, the main, the, the, yes, the main element of your strategy. Then, of course, and this is actually the topic of this panel, the plan to link the public policies with your transition plan in order to, yes. Um, uh, meet the national level at the uh, private level. And uh, last, the validation by third parties. This is really key to uh, have yes validated transition plan and to start assessing and compare it and compare it, yes, and uh, benchmark, sorry, the different uh, companies based on their transition plan. So this actually makes a good link now with to effective transition plan. We talk about disclosure all the time. I think the second step that we talk less is about performance, uh, climate performance. You can actually disclose in a very sensitive way to be complying with all the best standards, but actually the disclosure is just to assess, and this is 
actually what we do at ACT Initiative. So just to give a global overview for those who don't know this initiative, it comes from, uh, it is registered at the Climate Action Agenda from the UNFCCC, uh, so they back, in, back, back to COP22. Uh, so three main things to have in mind uh, on this methodology. First, it's international. The key concept here is about climate accountability. I think it's very important to have this in mind. And the last one is that it's open source. Uh, so these three elements is our, to me, yes, very key uh, on this methodology. So basically, we're working on, co on corporates. It's a sectoral methodology. We have 14 uh, sectors uh, covered. They are the most limiting ones. Uh, uh, OK, and uh, so yes, it's based uh, initially on corporates. And now, uh, I will detail it, we have a, a methodology for financial institution. Um, so yes, what do we assess? Uh, actually, what we assess is the readiness of the company to embark on the transition pathway. Basically, as we said, uh, we, uh, we assess the capability of the company to meet its journey to net zero. So basically, uh, out the output of the ACT methodology is a score. The, uh, according to the score, you can understand if the company is on its way to true transition or not. So it's quite a, uh, insightful uh, information. And of course, it's also a tool for many stakeholders to support and uh, uh, yes, uh, go uh, to support the, the company. Uh, just uh, an element also on ACT, uh, maybe as a credential, uh, ACT along with another initiative, uh, for instance, Climate Action Hundred Plus, is considered by GFUNDS as one of the most comprehensive methods for assessing a corporate transition plan in their last report of September 2022. So I think it's a good. Uh, uh, yes, uh, credential to, to share with you. So, uh, yes, I actually already mentioned the sectors covered, well, the, the 14. Uh, so, as you can see, they are the most emitting one. I'm not going to uh, do all the lists. Uh, maybe the key information here is that we have benchmark associated with some of the sectors. Uh, we are working very closely with the World Benchmarking Alliance. They are actually now uh, owner of uh, some of, uh, of this methodology. So go check also their, their uh, brilliant work on this. So automobile, transport, oil and gas, utilities, and transport is the most recent one. Uh, they are also the financial system benchmark that you should uh, have a check on it. Uh, so basically, to date, it's 270 companies assessed. Uh, one uh, very uh, yeah, impactful figure here is that only 12% of the 167 companies assessed do not have adequate short-term climate targets. Short-term climate targets. So does it mean if I just means that we are very far from having credible and robust even targets. Um, now, if I go to a specific method, which I am in charge in, uh, I was very excited to share with you some insight on this. So this is the ACT for Finance methodology. The aim is the very same for, than for ACT co for companies, is to assess the, the decarbonization strategy of a financial institution. So basically, we have been dividing the methodology in two, one, for, one methodology for bank and one methodology for investors, based on different reasons, regulate, 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 regulatory sorry, view, way of engaging, for instance. And so, yes, we, well, I, don't, I don't have actually to explain that yeah, in the article of the Paris Agreement, we have to reorientate financial flows, etc. It's We all know that. So, yes, the, the, main, the main, actually, concept that I wanted to share with you on this methodology and to have a look for you on that because we are starting to road test the methodology in January. Uh, but it's all about also climate accountability. We are taking also a commitment assessment approach. Uh, and the idea is not only to measure the risk of transition, but really to measure the impact of the, of the financial institution. So we look at various uh, elements, not only finance emission, but also where does the money go? Does it go to company with a uh, transition plan robust and credible? Does it go to taxonomic activities? We do, we do some mathematics and uh, actually uh, give some uh, insightful output uh, on, uh, on, this, on the strategy and performance, climate performance sorry, of the, the financial institution. Um, I think I sh should stop here, so thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Jan. Thanks, Elsa. Thanks, Louise. Thanks a lot, Anatole. We can uh, now move to the uh, panel discussion. So I will uh, introduce uh, Mathieu Garnero, uh, who uh, actually lead uh, the Finance Climate Project. And he will be 
pleased to introduce all his panelists, but I can. Thank you, Roma. Uh, please uh, let the panelists uh, enter <laughs> in the scene. <laughs> So thank you very much uh, and thank you for the presentators of the, the first part of, uh, of the event. I, I think it, uh, it has been very uh, insightful and uh, it shows the great work that has been done on this uh, key topic. So um, I'm, uh, I'm really happy to, to present and to, to moderate uh, the second part of the event. And, uh, and we have uh, gathered in this uh, round table very strong expertise, but what is very interesting, I think, it's uh, we have very different views on this topic. Huh? You, you will see we have a, a very diversified panel uh, with uh, uh, policy makers, academics, uh, representatives of banks, of uh, real economic company, and also of uh, NGO. So it's a very uh, uh, 360 uh, degree uh, panel. And, uh, and so I will uh, shortly introduce uh, all, uh, all the panelists and, uh, and we will uh, start the discussion. So uh, we have uh, Paolo Caridi, uh, which is head of unit at uh, DG Clima. Uh, we have Emilio Lebre La, La Rovere, uh, which is full professor uh, of uh, energy planning program at the Universidad Federal do, do Rio de Janeiro. Uh, we have uh, Pierre Canet, uh, Director of Advocacy and Campaign at WWF. Uh, then uh, Simon Kramer, uh, Director of Data Strategy for the GFUNS. Then uh, Charlotte Hugman, a research lead on climate and energy benchmark at the World Benchmarking Alliance. And last but not least, Facundo Echebere, which is, uh, who is VP of uh, Global Public Affairs at Danone. So uh, happy uh, <laughs> to see you all. And uh, so the, the round table uh, will, be, will be shared in uh, three parts. Uh, so the first part will be the link between the NDCs and the sectoral roadmaps. The second part will be financing the transition. And the last part uh, will be a discussion of, on the necessary dialogue between state, finance, and companies and sectors. So for, for the first one, I, I will uh, uh, introduce uh, the, the panel with, uh, with Paolo. Uh, so uh, European Commission has a, has a clear and transparent strategy to achieve a transition uh, uh, through the Green Deal and the Fit for 55. Uh, can you explain us how this planification is split between the European level, national level, but also the, the sectoral levels. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, indeed, so our um, strategy is uh, coming from the EU Green Deal. We have a climate law which sets clear objective, both decarbonization by 2050, but shorter term, at least 55% reduction by 2030. Now. I'll not bore you with a list of legislation, but it's basically 13 different pieces of legislation which are being approved as we speak. Uh, tonight we just finished, uh, we have a political agreement also on uh, land use, uh, land use change and forestry. But to stick to the topic of today, so let me try to categorize a little bit the different uh, policies according to their regional or, or EU level. So I would say at EU level, very clearly, we have our flagship, which is the emission trading system. It covers, at present, roughly 50% of emissions, 11,000 large or very large um, emitters, being energy and industry, basically. Um, this is going to continue and is going, in fact, to not only have a higher level of ambition, because we are planning to have 61% reduction of emissions in that sector by 2030, but we, there is also a proposal uh, from the European Commission to include also um, emission related to road transport and houses, basically, heating and cooling in that piece of legislation. And that's interesting because we are basically trying to move at EU level something which so far has been uh, mostly at member state level or even at lower levels. Uh, but that I will explain, and we have only two minutes, not really completely at EU level. Then still at EU level you have car emissions, CO2 emissions, 
and another of other a number of other regulations related for instance on energy label and products and so on the last bit which is really at the central level at this stage is uh, the carbon booster adjustment mechanism which is basically a measure which is uh, aiming at preventing that basically our emission reduction does not lead industry to leave or import a good in places where there are no stringent uh, carbon emission regulation in place to basically uh, flood the EU market. Now, this is basically what is really a central EU level. Then there is a number of things which are at member state level. The first is basically what we call effort shared regulation, which is basically we agree with member states uh, how much they can reduce. Uh, so this used to be in a range between 0 and 40% by 2030. Now we are increasing it to 10 to 50%, depending on the level of wealth, uh, mostly of the level of wealth of our, of our respective member states. Then there are also objectives which are set at the EU level, like renewable, 40% reduction, like energy efficiency, uh, and um, targets and those are set at EU level in agreement with the Parliament and the Member States but then concrete implementation is done at Member State level but of course in close cooperation with regions or companies obviously because they are the one who, who really do the thing on the ground. Uh, I, I wanted just to say a quick word on the house and road transport and, and basically in this sector there is a mix now because in our, in our proposal we want to include it in the emission trading system which is EU level but it's also included in the effort sharing so member states will remain also responsible for doing their parts because we know that the emission trading will not solve all issues because these two sectors are not so sensitive to price uh, so it, you don't obey just because your energy prices are higher. We see it now with the energy crisis. Uh, so if there is a need to do many other policies, and I, I don't have to, to elaborate. Um, last point, at sub-member sub state level, so sub-national level, uh, we don't really do at EU level policy, of course, at that level. But what we do is try to create incentives. And that's what we do, for instance, with cities with two main initiatives. One is the Covenant of Mayors, which has been existing for, for a long time, which we are uh, promoting very strongly. Uh, and then now also we have uh, 100 cities which are basically committed to go to uh, zero net emission already by 2030, so leading the way uh, into what we see as being uh, the basically front running to what everybody else will have to do. I think I should stop here. I already spoke too long. Thank you, Paolo. Uh, yes, we will uh, switch to, uh, to Emilio to discuss a bit about uh, the Brazil and with the perspective of Emilio, we actually uh, lo uh, lo do a lot of work in the context of IPCC too. So uh, maybe Emilio, can you share with us uh, what is your view? How can NDCs can be translated into strategy and public policies? Yes, thank you very much for the invi invitation. Good morning, everyone. Uh, in the case of uh, emerging economies like Brazil, uh, we mostly have economy-wide targets of emission reductions in the NDCs. And we still miss uh, the burden sharing and the sectoral targets. And when you come to industry, to the subsectors of industry. So it's very important for us to check the uh, European example in particular, uh, where this discussion is much more advanced. In the case of Brazil, we have uh, an NDC giving some illustrative, indicative um, uh, policies and, and measures, talking about the control of deforestation, because land use change emissions are very important. And also, of course, in the energy system, where we already have a, a basis of 45% uh, of the energy mix is renewable and 80% of the power generation is also coming from renewables. Now, coming to implementation, you were in good track up to uh, 
2012, but in the last uh, three, four years, the, uh, we went off track in, uh, and with this administration, federal administration, we moved in the opposite di direction mainly because of the growth of emissions in, of uh, deforestation in the Amazon. But uh, the problem is the burden sharing. There is already a provision for a cap and trade system for industry. Uh, uh, presidential decree was approved in May this year. But again, uh, how much of grandfathering, how much of uh, uh, target uh, sh sharing across the sectors. And this gives, of course, some common companies are front runners and they just announced net zero commitments for 2050 or 2040, but we, the credibility is quite low because we don't know exactly the transition plans, as was pointed out. So there is always the risk of greenwashing. So uh, the point is we need some institutional building and the government has to lead the discussion. And uh, this is crucial. Uh, for having this establishment of clear sectoral targets and coming to the company levels. So it was very nice to run this ACT DDP project in Brazil. It was very important to exchange with IDRI colleagues, with uh, ADEM colleagues and uh, our Mexican colleagues as well, in order that we could uh, try to have our national scenarios connected to sectoral scenarios and giving benchmarking for the companies. And the stakeholder involvement was a crucial part of it because we actually, when the industry sees the pairs uh, coming, then it raises trust and ownership of the exercise. And many interesting discussion with some examples of concrete dialogues because the industry actually was missing very much this dialogue spaces to uh, dialogue mainly with the government. So some concrete advances even, for instance, uh, agreement on energy uh, balances, figures that, uh, for instance, Cementi Industry Association was not in agreement with the national energy balance figure. Then a uh, proposal for reduction of an import tax for the, an energy efficiency equipment. So we have a very good stories of very concrete results of this kind of approach. And I think uh, uh, it's a, a crucial step really to have this linkage between the national, sectoral and company levels. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Pierre Canet, uh, maybe can you share your view uh, about uh, France from an uh, NGO perspective? Yes, uh, hello everybody, so I'm happy to be with you. I see representatives from different uh, stakeholders, industry, companies, uh, civil society, and when I, governments, and when we have this title about planning the transition, if I was asking you how do you feel about planning the transition, I would have perhaps different kinds of answers. So maybe up after what you just said about the EU, about Brazil, in a context where we have this uh, big energy crisis after two years of COVID-19 sanitary uh, pandemics, I would probably begin by asking about what is this transition we want? What is this kind of society projects that we want to develop? What is the raison d'etre of these projects? Because I hear a lot about the mechanisms, the plannings, evaluations, reductions of emissions, but at the end, why do we want this new society? What does make sense for us as citizens? So NGOs, to us, it's important to perhaps question the objective of this. And when we speak about the forest, when we speak about renewables, why does it mean so much to us in this context of energy crisis? Why do we need to phase out fossil fuels and go towards higher energy savings and higher energy renewables? And I think this is the first point to be fulfilled in the planning of the transition. Otherwise, we will lose people, we will lose citizens. 
we need in this U-turn to get a raison d'être to be able to engage all stakeholders of the society. We have lived in France, the Yellow Vests, questioning the way that governance is actually working, questioning decision makers and decisions, questioning as well the just transition, the social component of the transition. So if this is critical when we're speaking about planning the transition to ask what kind of transition, what is the principles of this transition, and what are the goals to make sure that everybody is on board and that the decisions made helps to make sure that this is a project for our society. Then, once you're clear about that, you need to make clear about the responsibilities and roles. We have a framework, we have policies, we have targets, we have regulations. What does it mean for you as an industry, as a company, as a group and of sectoral companies? What does it mean for you as cities? What does it mean for you as regions and local governments? And once we are clear about the responsibilities and roles, then as a company, a staff, a team, the team works together to make sure we achieve the objectives. So the planning is just about that. How do you plan the roles and responsibilities? And then making sure that you can follow up the implementation of it. Implementation that must be guided, we spoke about the targets. Indicators, when I saw your presentation about ACT for companies, all the different steps, the notion of indicators and targets is very important and we are now also uh, keen to see the indicators to support the planning. What are the key indicators that will help to implement and follow up? Speaking of indicators, WF developed um, a kind of um, future 2027 for the elections in terms of vision for the planning and we pushed the overshoot day or the f footprint. When we speak of the FIT 55, we are speaking also of territorial emissions. And as the EU is being negotiating just uh, two days ago, the new um, regulation against uh, deforestation, it is for this legislation against deforestation, putting on the table the question of our responsibilities in terms of the question of responsibilities in terms of footprint. And this is why we push an indicator on footprint to make sure that we just don't have the only the domestic picture. Other things about indicators. We are speaking about the transition and here in this fora, we have a lot about climate change. But this transition is about ecology and environment. It's about social justice, as I mentioned. And so environment is also about biodiversity. And the French president in his speech emphasized the relationship between climate and biodiversity. And this is why when we speak about the sectors, we mentioned a lot today, sectoral emissions, uh, infrastructures, transport. We need to have also in mind the carbon sinks. And so all the work to be done in terms of restoration what the EU can do in terms of restoration. And thank you, the Commission, for your bold proposals regarding restoration. Now it needs to be supported by the member states. And we need 20% restoration by 2030. So our ecosystems are also put in the picture to make sure that we protect and restore nature, because this is part of the planning we need. And I will conclude in terms of planning. We need agriculture as well. Agriculture is new in the COP now. We have uh, discussions going on, not going well under UNFCCC. But agriculture in France, for instance, is put aside. It's not part of the discussions we have in with all stakeholders regarding the planning of the transition. We need agriculture systems to be put on the table for the planning. Uh. Thank you very much, uh, Pierre, for your, for your message. Huh? Uh, very clear. Uh, Maybe we can we are we have to switch to the sectoral level and uh, and yes with uh, to start with uh, Charlotte Eggman. Uh, so uh, you did a, a great work uh, providing benchmark uh, across uh, different sectors and countries. Uh, and so, what are the most challenging sectors, to your to your opinion, to be addressed in priority uh, based on your work? Thank you so much. And it's been fantastic to hear from all of the panelists. I think to bring in the regional 
the country in Brazil and then also the civil society perspective, including on just transition. So thank you all for contextualizing some of the results I can share from the World Benchmarking Alliance's work. So we heard from the ADEM team from Anatol about the 270 high emitting real, real economy companies that we have assessed using the ACT methodology to assess their transition plans. And to directly answer your question, across the four sectors we've looked at so far, we heard earlier those were the automotive manufacturers, the electric utilities, particularly electricity generation companies, as well as oil and gas and transportation companies. It's actually quite a difficult question to answer. All four of them show worryingly low scores on the transition planning. So to put that in context and to give a few concrete examples, from the oil and gas benchmark, we saw that um, 70 of the 100 companies we assessed either scored zero or only basic. So we're looking at sort of one point out of, out of six here on their transition plans. And that's one of the things that our free and publicly available benchmarks that the World Benchmarking Alliance can do. They can give that snapshot of how sectors are doing. And we benchmark the most globally influential companies and financial institutions to provide that snapshot so each company has a scorecard. So you can look at the details around their planning, their consistency. Are they um, planning for CapEx investments in low carbon technology? As well as indeed creating that snapshot per sector. So I just gave an example there from oil and gas of a bit of a doom and gloom story potentially on the overall quite low scores on transition planning. But another thing that our benchmarks can and do do is highlight and promote the leadership we see. So to take a concrete example from that sector in the oil and gas sector, the company that actually tops the leaderboard is a Finnish headquartered company called Neste. Um, and to just draw on a couple of, of good practices from their transition plan, they have a 1.2 billion euro revolving credit facility, so a loan that is linked to achieving their greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets. We also see in their transition plan a good example of applying a carbon price. Um, at the time of assessment, that was $40. So I did want to highlight it's not all doom and gloom and that our benchmarks do highlight leadership and act as that free and publicly available accountability mechanism, company by company and also sector by sector. And I think, Emilio, you made a great point about we need now, you know, the urgency is here. We need to go beyond setting long-term net zero targets and really for companies to be transparent and credible and really back up those longer term targets and that's what I think some of our leading companies in our benchmarks do. And just to wrap up, I wanted to make the link back to something we've been hearing about a little bit on the nationally determined contributions and another example from our electric utilities benchmark in which we assessed companies from different regions and in one country in particular, um, in Asia, we saw very interesting results around um, target setting and transition planning whereby uh, companies headquartered in Japan had actually um, aligned and had the same emissions intensity in their targets because they had come together, they'd worked together, so great to see that collaboration, but they had aligned to the the, what was then the nationally determined contribution. And of course our assessment was looking at the scenario pathway, so we saw a gap here. Uh, the companies were saying, but we're aligning with our NDC, but we're saying, but we know that the pathway needs to be more ambitious. And I think that's a really great example of how our benchmarks in their transparent way can also draw out that accountability and shine a light on where NDCs really walking the talk and actually being ambitious enough will then help companies and industry follow. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Charlotte, for this uh, very concrete example. And to, to keep uh, going in uh, details and uh, real, <laughs> real life, real economy, uh, maybe we, we will switch with uh, Facundo. Uh, can you give us uh, maybe uh, what is uh, your view uh, uh, at Danone? Uh, what do you expect from the national level transition plan? And uh, how, how can you contribute to the indices uh, of uh, the different countries uh, where you operate? Thanks a lot for the invitation. Well, in fact, the challenge is to make it actionable. No, We need to stop the declarative approach and we need to start con with concrete action plans. So within the, the sectorial chambers, we believe in the accountability, ambition, and action. No, The triple A in a different way. Accountability is about uh, recognizing, having the clear data, disclosing, uh, facing the challenge, 
facing the challenge in the full value chain, including agriculture. And as I know, we have started this journey in 2015 with our policy on climate. But it's a long journey. We need to recognize the challenges we are facing as a multi-local company. We are operating in different realities. It's not the same our operation here in France or in, 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 in Africa or in Latin America and US. We are having a multiple fragmented policy discussions. We have a challenge when we have to implement we want to implement a value chain transformation with the incentives that are going in the opposite direction of our ambition in terms of transition towards zero net. So we need to make it concrete at local level. We need to have localized uh, conversations on these specific blockers for the transitions to really unleash the potential and to accelerate this convergence. So as a sectorial approach, we have going to communicate tomorrow a call to action, a call to action to, to make it more concrete, the national plus, the NDCs, including food and agriculture in the core. We need that. We need that to accelerate the transition with other companies. This is pre-competitive. We need to work together with Nestlé, with Unilever. It's not about one company. It's not a reputation strategy. It's not for greenwashing. It's not. It's about to allow us to work with our, the farmers, with our supply chain to do the transformations. So we are embarked on this. We are engaged. And we are happy to, to have more dialogues with the private, public sector and with our companies to accelerate it. Thank you very much, uh, Facundo. Um, so, yes, we will go to the second part of the discussion with the financing transition. And, uh, and we, we are very pleased to, to have uh, S uh, Simon Kramer to, to discuss about that. So, as we have seen, uh, both sectoral roadmaps and company transition plan show there is a huge need for both public and private support and uh, with a funding investment. And so, uh, what are the financing needs that we are talking about, uh, Simon? And how uh, do you see the role of private financing institution and coalition, like the GFUNDS, in this challenge? Yeah, great. So, I, mean, I think it's very clear that there's a strong need for both public and private finance. And in terms of private sector finance, GFANS um, is seeking to provide the tools needed to ultimately unlock the effective alignment of capital to a uh, net zero transition. And so in terms of how we're doing that, and I think it's important to really understand what is needed for private finance to get there in addition to the needs for private finance to, to, to fund. Um, private finance needs the right tools to enable the appropriate decision making. And so GFANS in the last year has released several different deliverables that should support this, this path forward. Uh, first off, we've released our guidance for net zero transition planning for financial institutions. So essentially providing pan-sector guidance for how financial institutions can change their internal strategies to be aligned with the net zero economy. We also published guidance on an overview on what real economy companies are doing to transition plan because ultimately financial institutions will need to understand the underlying strategies of their portfolio companies to develop their firm-wide um, paths forward. We've also provided information on how to utilize sectoral pathways in transition planning effectively and briefs on what that looks like for individual sectors. Um, and we've also provided some more information on how firms can assess forward-looking portfolio alignment. So that's basically providing the base level of tools needed to start incorporating net zero into decision making. But in terms of the type of financing that's needed in particular, I think there's a pretty significant area of work that GFANS has been engaging in through the development of regional networks. It's obvious that net zero is not a one-size-fits-all approach, and there are going to be different needs contingent on the region. And so we've developed this year an Asia-Pacific and an Africa regional network with the focus of understanding what financial institutions need in individual regions and countries to better uh, meet their needs to, to set their path on the net zero journey, um, but also to understand what best practices look like globally. Because again, um, this is a journey that's going to be addressed differently contingent on the location of the firm and it's important that we are cognizant of this in our next steps. 
I think taking a step back to the presentation that was made earlier today by ADEM, we spoke a lot about sectoral pathways. We're talking about what's needed for next steps, but I think bringing in the concept of key performance indicators, there is a step before transition planning that is understanding transition risks and opportunities. And I think there was quite a bit of discussion on, for example, understanding how demand is going to change, understanding, you know, how real economy companies are going to think about their supply chains and better understanding the risk there and that obviously applies on a financial institution level and I think a key need underlying all of this is the data to actually make these decisions and so you know I think in, in, in my other role um, you know the French government and GFANS are both um, members of the climate data steering committee that's really been focused on the identification of the key underlying data that will allow for effective decision making to be made and alignment with net zero and I think that that transparency is going to be a key force in unlocking future alignment alongside uh, the next steps of transition planning. Thank you, Simon. Um, we discuss uh, about uh, financial institution. Uh, it's, uh, the, the, the question is uh, for you, Charlotte. Huh? You published with WBA, WBA uh, a new benchmark uh, this week huh? with uh, 400 financial institutions in this benchmark. Can you give us uh, some flavor of uh, the conclusion of this study? Absolutely, very happy to and we're really excited to have launched this new benchmark. As you mentioned, it came, uh, went live uh, earlier this week and it covers 400, again, the globally influential piece that WBA covers. So 400 globally influential financial institutions across banks, asset managers, asset owners, uh, including pension funds, uh, sovereign wealth funds and development finance institutions as well as insurance companies. So we have here a really system-wide look at how companies are doing and the, the methodology includes um, a look at their governance and strategy for sustainability as well as uh, indicators across nature and biodiversity and the social piece including human rights. But of course for this discussion I would like to zoom in on the findings around particularly climate transition planning. So what do we see and how does that compare to other sectors? So our finding is here of the 400 institutions assessed, 37 we've identified have long-term net zero targets. And to place that in context for the electric utilities and transport benchmarks and that real estate, uh, real economy, sorry, company side of our, our work at WBA, those two sectors we identified roughly half have long-term net zero plans, whereas in the oil and gas and automotive manufacturing sectors it's much lower, it's more around sort of one-fifth. So that places that in context. I think a really key detail here, and I would encourage everyone to go and look at the website where you can again find each institution's scorecard with much more detail about their disclosure, their commitments, and actions demonstrated. I think a really key detail here for this discussion, and why we're so pleased to be working on the Climate Data Steering Committee with Simone and her team, is that we do see that GFUNS members do a little better overall. So we see that this piece around collaboration, around industry, the finance system, working together with policymakers back and forth can really help and drive action. Because somewhat, uh, I think, somewhat uh, to highlight as well, we talked earlier about the credibility. So it's great to start by setting these longer term net, net zero targets. But we found from our assessment that went live earlier this week that only 2% of the 400 assessed have translated those longer term net zero targets into um, plans with shorter term, so interim milestones. And we know that those interim targets are so critical to drive action, of course, for the institutions themselves, but also to enable the stakeholders that want to work together with the finance system to, of course, hold them accountable, but really work together on this and really achieve this together. So I really echo what Simone was saying about collaboration, not only between the finance system and uh, real economy companies, but also with policymakers. And in the real economy, indeed, I think making sure that sectors are speaking to each other. We saw in the FT recently, I think it was last week, the Danish shipping company Maersk calling on others in its value chain to make sure that that supply and demand is really going to be met. Maersk as one company cannot do this alone. That's why I'm so pleased that this discussion brings in all these different perspectives at the different levels. And we're really pleased, as I say, to be working with, um, with institutions like Simone's and others to make sure that our findings can really take um, this forward into policy, into action. 
Thanks. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, both of you. It provides a good view of the, of the commitments of uh, financial pri private financial institution. And we'll, I will ask the, the same type of question to uh, to Pierre Canet. Uh, what what are your recommendations to improve uh, the planning of financing, but on the public side? <laughs> yes. How can we succeed in the planning without uh, the resources, financial resources? And we have, uh, we are living a time with the energy crisis where we are seeing the opposite of what we should do for the planning. First, starting to plan and program uh, the investment needed for the transition. So we have the Fit 55. Now, what is the finance, public finance plan to implement these objectives? Without this clear plan, it's uh, very, little probability that we can get to the objectives. So what we are asking WF in France, as we are currently in the middle of a budget debates in the parliament, is to make sure that we have the programming, the right programming of finance, public finance, for the next 15 years. We have it for uh, all defense supports. Why don't we have it for nature and climate? So we need to program it and we need to make sure that we fill the gap between what is put in terms of public finance on the table and what is needed to achieve the objectives. And I foresee is doing a wonderful job in terms of uh, assessing the level and the amount of investment needed. It is currently assessed to be between 13 and 30 billion of euros if you want to achieve the ecological transition and planning. So we need to find these fundings. And to, con to finish, the other part is about the harmful subsidies, because you can put billions on the table, but if at the same time France and other countries are supporting fossil fuels, we will not get to the objectives. So we need to plan an exit plan for the harmful subsidies, whether it is for climate or nature, we need to exi exit this harmful subsidies. And I was mentioning the energy crisis. We are currently a lot of different supports and subsidies being deblocked with billions of dollars on the table, not targeted to uh, in terms of social revenues or dependency on transport. So we've seen in France the budget doubling its harmful subsidies this year and for the next year it's going to be the same. So this is problematic to see that there is no planning of the subsidies we need to phase out the harmful subsidies and support the tradition. But it can't be made year after year. It needs to be planned as well. So these are the recommendations we are pushing currently in the debates having around the, the French budgets. Thank you uh, for this message. Uh, so last round for discussion uh, to discuss about the, the necessary dialogue between state, finance, and companies, and how to do this. Uh, and, and first, to dialogue and to, co to, to, to work together. Transition planning is also a, a question of trust and cooperation. And, and my first question is uh, for Paolo Caridi. Uh, at this stage, transition is mostly a matter of transparency. How uh, Europe will ensure that these plans uh, get implemented and that transparency finally transforms into action? Yeah, thank you. Well, excellent question. Uh, well, I think in terms of transparency, at the EU level, we are more or less fine in the sense that we, everything is publicly available, I uh, dare say, and we, we, we are not too bad than that. But then you're right, we should also try to show how implementation uh, will happen and make it also clear. Of course, that does not necessarily rely on our, ourselves. Partly it does. Uh, again, if I take again our palette of policy instruments, there are some on which we are directly responsible for the implementation, emission trading system, obviously, and on that there are monitoring system which finally, because it was, it, it took time to have a proper reporting and a proper uh, verification system, but I think now we are, we have a very good system, so I think we can rely on the data that company puts there. They have to surrender uh, their, 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 uh, their credits, so there are a lot of money involved, and, but I think we have a pretty robust system. Uh, when it's more difficult, and I would say it's more or less same for CO2 for cars, where we have be also learning from a previous 
uh, shortcomings and I think we are putting in place a system which is much more robust than it used to be. But then what I think is interesting is the way we try to go down basically the chain. So basically uh, for us it's boiled down to monitoring what member states are doing and this is done through a number of instruments. I don't want to bore you too much, but basically I would say two, two key, key points here. On, on one side, we work with member states to develop their own uh, climate and energy plans. So they develop their plans, we work together, we ask for adjustment, they get published typically, and then there is a monitoring system, which is a mix of annual monitoring, relatively light, based on, on emissions mostly, and then there is a five-year monitoring which goes much more into the details, basically, or respect of a plan. Then there is a second bit which is related to actual topic, uh, recovery and resilient facility, which is, of course is not, it was meant mostly for COVID recovery, but in fact uh, we have been e basically obliging uh, member states to earmark 37% uh, of the money which goes uh, into, the, into the, these funds to be used for activity which are climate related. So as Director General for Climate Action, we are quite involved into this monitoring exercise, which is not only about climate, but of course we want to make sure that what has been pledged to be used for climate related activity re really, really goes there. Uh, and maybe last point uh, is about uh, mainstreaming. We also have EU budget, of course, is not huge as such, but still it's, it can be quite interesting catalyst effect. And we have also uh, having a, a, a mainstreaming, so all policies should, well, at least not be prejudicial, so not harming, basically, climate and environment. But also, again, there is a 30% earmarked for climate-related activities. So that's a big change which has been happening in the last financial cycle and uh, again we have also a monitoring so we work with other services of the commission to make sure this is properly implemented on the ground thank you thank you emilio you you have quite an experience of uh, engaging private companies in national and uh, sectoral uh, decarbonization dialogue can you give us some feedback and maybe some key of success uh, based on on your experience Yes, of course, industry comes uh, to the table to discuss with uh, other stakeholders, the scientific community, government officials, and NGOs when there is something really important at stake. When some regulation is being discussed that might affect the industry and so on. So this subject here is quite important and uh, we can shape the discussion in such a way because of course the industry lacks information about the other sectors they don't normally they don't have except very huge enterprise they don't have uh, expertise in other sectors and uh, this connection between national uh, sectoral and subsectoral targets uh, uh, they are curious about it. So uh, I think uh, this is the first point. And the second point is also depends a lot on the sector of activity, the market uh, structure, in our case of emerging economies, what is the share of production destined to exports. And uh, in this exercise for ACT DDP project, we have looked to three uh, subsectors, power generation, the cement industry, and uh, beef production in Brazil. And while the cement industry is quite straightforward, uh, scope one and two emissions are the most important. They already had done some uh, technological roadmaps for net zero with the international aid agents and others uh, and the same for power generation where the discussion is also very clear they many of them are actually working on uh, renewable sources of energy so they 
carbon footprint of kilowatt hour in Brazil is very, very low. So these uh, companies were very willing to join, to uh, showcase their experience and highlight their, uh, um, say, uh, good practices. Now, when you come to a very challenging sector that we have picked up for purpose, that is uh, the beef production, where the big meat producers and exporters actually uh, just stay less than one day with the heads of cattle to be slaughtered, and they depend on supply chains with tens of thousands of small producers, the situation is much more difficult to have them involved. Only then have access to the primary data. They are constantly sampling over 40,000 uh, uh, suppliers, and some of them are discredited, and then they have to pass eligibility checks to, to be again accredited. But uh, then we have to rely on their willingness uh, to disclosure the information. That's where we stand. So that's why the, the interaction with the government and the third part certification that will be sooner or later required comes to be very important. So in this sense, also what we are talking about finance can provide some incentives that be not only, say, on the stick side, but also on the carrot. If we have some uh, soft uh, financing with smart financial mechanisms lead, uh, uh, linked to uh, field path certification, can help to move the industries forward. Thank you. So the two last question, the first one is for, for Facundo. Uh, you are planning your transition at Danone. How have you involved the state as a financial actor in, in your process? Huh? That is a good question. In fact, um, well, we can talk about Africa. Um, we are being, having the challenge to have uh, the sourcing of milk. Just put it in concrete, local. When we localize milk in Africa, we increase our carbon footprint. So we need to work in a holistic approach, including them, the farmers and the local government in the process to transfer technology, to educate the farmers, to improve the way they feed the cows, to localize feeding, to include people, to take care of the livelihood of the farmers. So we cannot do it alone. It's impossible. We need the, the coordination of efforts. We need to present the case that we need supply. We are the clients, and we want to be part of the solution. We want to develop the sector in the way that is fitting for the future, not just in a productivist approach, not just having milk. It's having milk that is fitting with all these topics. It's climate, it's social, economics of the equation. And we are working with the European Union. In fact, in a few days, we are having a meeting, European Union, with the African countries to explore value chain development. And we are going to be part of the dialogue. It's about dialogue, identifying the blocking points, but being pragmatic, because we cannot discuss the abstract things, absolute values. We have that. We have science by target, 1.5. We have our trajectory. We have identified all the barriers and needs in terms of investment. But we don't, if we don't coordinate our efforts, it's going to be impossible. We need to replicate in Europe, for example, what we have done in the US. In the US, we have just received $70 million for concrete projects in terms of transition, agriculture, helping our farmers to accelerate. In Europe, we need that. If we wait to change the policies in terms of subsidies, we are going to be too late. We need to implement innovative solutions, incentives. We are happy to work now after this meeting, for example. Thank you. And uh, last question for, for Simon. Um, we uh, just, uh, Facundo just talked about blocking points. Uh, and uh, yes, at, at GFUNDS, how can GFUNDS help to reconcile a top down strategy? So shifting the trillions and the, the bottom up feedback loop, uh, what the identification of obstacle and blocking points? So I think that 
a key message that GFANS is seeking to put forward is that financial institutions should not just be engaging in the net zero conversation in order to align their portfolios to net zero, but rather think about how they can impact the decarbonization of the real economy. Uh, and so we've developed four investment strategies that we hope will help move the needle forward and again bring these concepts together. Um, first, the, the most common strategy is investing in companies that are already aligned to 1.5 degrees and we've been building out and have been hearing about many of the tools that will allow for investors to do this. Um, we also support investment in climate solutions um, in terms of the actual technologies that will lead to clean energy, carbon removal, and other positive um, effects on uh, climate change mitigation. Um, but in addition to that, we have two other strategies that I think are really paramount in terms of moving the needle and again, thinking a little bit more holistically about how we can solve the problem. Um, first thinking about going where the emissions are and actively engaging on behalf of the financial sector with the real economy on how firms with robust transition plans can ultimately actually make that transition to alignment. They may not be aligned today, but how can we, um, through these initiatives, give them the building blocks and engagement and support that they need to get there? And, and how can finance play a very key role there? Because what you don't want to see is a complete removal oops, of financing and of investment from firms that might not immediately map to 1.5, but that may represent key sectors of the economy um, or that might be in the process of transitioning in a meaningful way. And the last strategy that's also critical is the managed phase out of, of high emitting assets. So rather than simply focusing on divestment, which can lead to these assets entering the wrong hands, which is certainly a risk and something we have seen happen in practice, how can financial institutions ultimately actually take a role in this managed phase out to ensure again that we're not just seeing benefits as it relates to portfolio performance towards 1.5, but we're really seeing the real tangible shifts needed in the real economy to align to our goals. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, this, this was the last word, <laughs> so uh, we are a bit out of time. Uh, thank you very much, all of you, for your participation. And uh, thank you for the French Pavilion for hosting this uh, event. Uh, and uh, uh, have a nice day at COP. Huh?
Silva.
Il me pète de soucis. C'est un peu haut, mais... Bonjour à tous, vous m'entendez bien Hello everyone, how well can you hear me Great, hello everyone, thank you, my name is Catherine Simonet, I'm an expert from, uh, for adaptation for the AFD uh, Climate and Nature Department. I'm very glad to have the opportunity to open this round table around an essential topic which is about managing and measuring adaptation. For more than 10 years we've been mobilized uh, and adaptation metrics. It was already a topic in Marrakech, but uh, even earlier. Adaptation is a key topic for the AFD. We dedicate 50% of our financements to climate issues. Two billions uh, are for investment projects that finance uh, collateral benefits for adaptation. We also know inside the AFD that there, are, there is room for improvement especially when it comes to the quality of the project. So when talking about long-term and efficiency and being impactful, it's important to have an adaptation on two legs, two fillers. And that's one of the objectives of that round table. It's about showing how strategy and research, uh, both academic research, but also capabilities building and learning and trainings contribute together to the adaptative approach. It's very important when you talk about adaptation to think long term but also to keep communicating with the research so that you gather data and keep questioning yourselves. That's why we, we have two facilities or two facilitators when it comes to the AFD. We have the adaptation one of from 12 to 18 countries. So the second phase is starting now. You'll see an illustration of that working, this way of working on two fillers with a research project, the Innovative Gap Track project that has been implemented by the IDRRA, and the support to strategies with the support that has been brought to the, to the NDCs with an evaluation follow-up. It's about supporting the NDC follow-up that has been implemented by Rumble. We also have the 2050 uh, facil facilitator. It's about supporting the, long, the country's long-term strategies. It's also be built upon two dimensions. You'll see the Vanuatu example where we finance both uh, long-term uh, with the GDI and uh, co-financing of New Zealand and a research uh, financement with the RLD uh, at a regional level. This uh, two facilities are a bit of a innovation uh, incubator in order to show how research and, plan and planning should cooperate in terms of adaptation. All right, where is Mathieu? Okay, uh, I'm going to give the floor to the research representatives and to those who are to implement these projects. Hello. My name is Mathieu Weimar, I'm a barista and I have the honor and pleasure to moderate. I'm all, only a negotiator here during the COP27. I'm also a counselor to the Tunisian <laughs> delegation. 
but I also have the pleasure to lead uh, an expert roundtable to talk about the topics that have been tackled by uh, my colleague when it comes to the adaptation results follow-up and the constraints of time. As you know, the Climate Action Tracker has published its new barometer this morning. Uh, perhaps have you read about it in the press? Uh, it's 2.7 uh, degrees uh, now if we were to follow the same path as until now. So that means the adaptation needs are going to be spectacular, which leads us to asking several questions around how we can, we can forecast and anticipate we as the researcher and how we can solve some problems when it comes to adaptation. So we're about to start with the analytics part and the uh, expert, Alexandre Mayong, doctor, uh, vulnerability uh, researcher um, inside the IDRRI. Uh, Alexandre, I would like to ask you to take the floor uh, at the first. Tell us how to capture the various uh, dimensions of adaptation in a short time, on a short notice, that will lead, help us answering uh, the question about consistency between countries and taking into account the resilience uh, pathway uh, at a global level, I'm a negotiator so that echoes somehow some topics we are discussing about during fierce debates, because it's, uh, of course, there is a global pathway and there are the, con the countries. Alexandre, Mr. Vemer, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. The question that should be asked when talking about this topic is why? Why do we have to do it? It's not just a question of reporting. It's just a question of justification of the funds that we receive and so on. Uh, that goes much farther. Uh, of course, the uh, climatic uh, risk is very important. In the last report of the IPCC uh, shows uh, the problem of the region. So the, we have to adapt. It's clear. There's no question about it. The question is, where are we? At what stage are we? Because the, on the attenuations, the, on the attenuation, there, there are some assessments about the adaptations. We don't know much. It's very difficult to know if at a global scale we make in progress and if we make enough of them, depending on the region and so on. And uh, there is uh, a call from, uh, from the national and international level and also local level. Uh, the question is, can you re answer? Can you give an answer on this question? Because when you are, so when we are supposed to create for future uh, public policies, we need to know where the starting point is, and do we have to move quick or not? And uh, enhance the uh, the necessity and of the monitoring of the tool. It's not reporting; it's a tool for the public policy and for the actors at different levels. And the question that we have to ask ourselves at this stage is: uh, we know this is a tool that will be used at different level levels, international down to, uh, to the lowest level. We need to make sure that people are talking about the same thing, which is not the case usually. In order to be able to, uh, in order to try to, read, to answer it, we've, we have developed for two years, thanks to the uh, uh, assistance of the uh, IFD, I would like to thank Christophe. We just had a, an idea, we just needed a trigger to uh, allow us to test this, um, uh, this, 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 this question. And we are happy to see that it is useful and works. It's the bad track, Global Adaptation Progress Tracker. I will try to, uh, to be brief. brief. Uh, the basic idea is that there's many people who are trying to assess uh, the adaptation basing on, uh, based on the national indic uh, indicators. We said, we, Idri, we are very small, there's nothing, we, there's not much uh, we can do. So we thought we would like to, to find another door, entry door, to know what is happening and to be complementary. And uh, that means to see the adaptation, its complexity. It's not that complex. It's the, the flower that you have in the middle, more or less. It's to tell ourselves we're not going to start to, to look for indicators. We'll try to 
identify the, uh, the questions to which we need to answer to have a more complex answer about what adaptation is actually. Uh, that's a, that's a, that looks small, but you'll find this flower on our website. We are, we are very flower-like. Uh, do we know the cli climate risk today or tomorrow? The uh, answer is not that. Uh, do you, what do we know about the, the planning of this adaptation? What do we know about the concrete actions being implemented? Uh, are they adequate or not? What do we know about the capacities, technical and financial and so on, that have already been implemented? Do we have any proofs? I don't know. Do we have a pointer? No. This question, do we have proofs, do we have evidence to reduce um, the climate risk? It's a very difficult scientific question. The rest is all for it. Everything is for it. What do we know uh, otherwise about the planning at very long term, what we call the adaptation trajectories in our uh, scientific community? For each of these questions, we have identified uh, some uh, sub-questions. We could identify thousands of them. The idea is not to identify uh, thousands of them, but to keep simple. Uh, to do it, we uh, we take uh, mm, a territory we do it in, in uh, Senegal and in, uh, in the island uh, of Maurice, we, and uh, we ask to, to, to expert to make a, uh, a scoring about all the uh, questions that you see in black. You know the uh, the, the scoring exercises, it's, uh, we, we may cr cr criticize them or, or think that they have uh, added value. In this context of adaptation, they have a huge added, added value because they go uh, beyond the, the knowledge and uh, the data that is at our disposal, which is very important when each time we talk about indicators. We could uh, speak much longer about it later. If you uh, see this framing, you see that it, uh, it can, it, it's to be applied at, at different levels, locally, uh, in sectors, the national uh, scale or world scale. This is what you've done. Just just about showing you an illustration. We'll not get into details here about what we've done in terms of uh, application in Senegal and Maurice, uh, the coast uh, adaptation in 21. It was a test, uh, genius. It works. So with 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 thought, we thought. Uh, I don't have much time. What we're doing today is that we apply it at a world level, global level. It's quite difficult to group the, to uh, to gather a, a group of experts, whether we are IPCC or not. We are not IPCC. To do it at a global level, we go through. Um, it's quite difficult to um, uh, to explain. I don't. I, I should have a, a slide about it, no, but I don't have it. Okay, we go through challenges that are common to all the countries. Adaptation of the coast, of the cities, uh, in the mountains, uh, in Arctic systems also when, uh, when it applies, but also in sections like health or energy. And we apply this small flower to one uh, of the challenges of adaptation. This year it's about coastal uh, adaptation, so we have a group of experts responsible of uh, assessing this uh, ad uh, coastal adaptation. We don't start by the water. We ask them to apply the flower to, to, to lots of local case studies, cities in particular, or regions, rural regions. So the flower is, the assessment is done at the very local uh, level. And then we can uh, either aggregate or play with, uh, with figures, but we can like go uh, higher on regional matters and finally uh, go to a global scale. So we are we are talking global on the basis of what we get very down uh, on on this uh, ladder. So uh, it's about connecting the scales and to bring the local to the global. I've heard for years and years this idea: okay, adaptation is local, and the attenuation is uh, global. No, it's not true. The attenuation is also local, and adaptation. Uh, should be also applied on a global scale. But the connection of the scales, to connect the two scales, local and global, is, is complicated in this type of tool. This is what we're trying to do. Okay, that's uh, good to know. Nothing. I'm trying to, uh, to do it quickly here. Another interesting thing, when you go through a scoring system, 
finally you uh, create a common language. So we uh, take concern all the dimensions of the flower. We end up by a uh, common language with a uh, capacity uh, evidence. We create a uh, 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 common language uh, among experts, if even they have. Uh, uh, if they have uh, different backgrounds, regional and uh, science also. So uh, we create a new language, uh, maybe uh, small but common, uh, between the scales. We'll be able to talk about adaptations at the local scale and connect it through aggregating to a global scale and uh, to see where act we actually are. Can I, I'll stop here because I think I, uh, I uh, used my time and there's so many other interesting things that will be said. So uh, uh, I uh, give the floor to you. The floor to you. Merci beaucoup. Uh. Thanks a lot, uh, Alexandre. This is highly interesting, and you've insisted, you've underlined the importance of connecting the scales from local to global to, to determine the adaptation pathway while showing the importance of uh, of expertise to um, to make it for the lack of data uh, but that means arrangements uh, to compensate data gas gaps but that means that requires organization of the governance so that things can be done inside an organization um, now going the other way round let's go from the original level to the, to the national, but then to the global level. I would like to give the floor to Raoul, Raoul from the uh, Natural Resources Direction. I would like to, uh, from the CEDAO, uh, how an organization as yours approaches these questions when it comes to planning, when it comes to adaptation, how do you coordinate, how do you manage the answers, the solutions that are proposed, and, and how do you structure things internally between the various sectors, the various industries, when it comes to the follow-up of the adaptation? Raoul, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mathieu. So, as Mathieu said, when it comes to the CEDAO, with the support of, uh, of uh, the French government and the EU, we have developed a regional climate strategy that has been adopted uh, in the, this year by the ministers of the, of the, that participate in the CDO. That's an important, that's a strategy that requires adaptation. From 2009 on, for us in Africa in general, but especially when it comes to Western Africa, adaptation is a part of our core priorities, which is why in 2010, um, back, in tw uh, back in 2010, we've adopted uh, a strategy regarding adaptation, and when it comes to new developments, uh, and then with the Paris Agreement, uh, authorities decided to create a global strategy that would integrate uh, the mitigation and adaptation aspects. It is indeed a quite a bit of a participative uh, process that includes all these stakeholders regionally, the regional organizations, and also the member states. Uh, that's a part of the of the rules uh, of the CDO that everything has to be adopted and the member states have to streamline and to, ac to accept and streamline those. So it's a very, very interactive, very participative that uh, welcomes aboard all the member states, all the stakeholders. The strategy bears, comes with a vision about a resilient community when it comes to the consequences of climate change while catching upon all the economic opportunities uh, towards a sustainable development. From 2022 up to 2050, we have a vision with two steps, 2030 and 2050, with a pl an action plan that, had been, that has been uh, divided into several activities, with uh, the NDCs taken into consideration but also the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. So this strategy, as I already told, ha is a, a two-levels strategy. You have the action plan, first thing, 
but, but you also have a vision, the, two, the 2050 vision that's also uh, streamlined in within the CDAO vision that has been uh, well, the, old, the older vision was to until until 2020. Now, from 2021, we've adopted a new vision, uh, a new perspective that leads us, that will take us towards 2050. So the idea was to align the original vision with the global CDIO vision, while making it agree, making it consistent with the 2030 perspective or prospect. So. Uh, the toolkit that allows us uh, to implement this strategy is built around the Environment uh, Directorate, the DG, the, the Environment DG, but all the departments are committed and engaged um, above all uh, apart from the Commission, all the sec sec uh, industry are uh, mobilized. The idea being from scratch to commit all the departments in the strategy that has been adopted for all the sectors, all the industries. Each sector, each industry develops its action plan and its work plan while streamlining all the elements of the strategy so that uh, at the end of the journey you have climate change in streamlined in each sector so that each sector can play its role its part when it comes to the follow-up you were asking about and the uh, evaluation of the steps the progress that has been made in the framework of the strategy implementation as I already said some actions have already been streamlined in the working programs and in, inside the agencies as well, because as a commission we have specialized agencies when it comes to gender, when it comes to energy, when it comes to various aspects, uh, in a energy efficiency, youth, etc. So that, as for, for us, each entity within the commission is able to play its part. So somebody asked me, what about the member states? Well, as I said, the strategy uh, is broken down in, in various uh, panels. So you have in each department, you, you, you find this, the same, this, the same uh, you have find a bridge with, minist with ministers from various member states, and they also play their part when it comes to the uh, nationally determined contributions, the NDCs. We ensure the general coordination, that's our part, as each year you get some reports, annual reports that are published by each department and that are synchronized and harmonized by each department in charge of the macroeconomics. So you find all the info, all the, day, all the data about all the progress that has been made by each department so that you get an annual report. Each year, what happens is we have a meeting with the House of Commons. Uh, you know that, uh, or the Parliament, because you know that the laws are adopted by the Parliament. And then when it comes to the NDC, we, we also have in the CD. Uh, CEDAO, we have a, an emanation of all the parliaments from all the, con all the countries. These people gather and uh, draw the, the pathway when it comes to the various rules, uh, regulations and laws that uh, have been created so that we can coordinate things. There is an inter in intergovernmental committee um, concentrated on the environment and the climate that gathers all the uh, industry uh, and sectors so that the platform is an exchange platform that allow us, allows us to communicate and streamline processes so that each department uh, knows and considers the necessity to streamline actions that, are, that fall within and are written in the global strategy so that we can all together uh, by the end of the year gather and uh, and write a report together in 2030 we had the action plan uh, is looking at 2030 
as a, as a time objective. So a strategy will be created so that another action plan can be built with a 2050 prospect, a more long-term one. From now to 2030, we all know that some uh, other um, some other trifles, um, some other some other issues, sorry, can uh, can show up. Now the priority. There is there has been the Paris Agreement, and from now to 2030, God knows what the new problems in in terms to climate change, what new uh, troubles, uh, what new strife could. Uh, could show up when it comes to climate change, so it's quite which makes it quite hard to forecast what could be the issues that will show up between 2030 and 2050. But the general idea is uh, the one I've uh, depicted when it comes to the strategy we've created, thanks to the cooperation with our partners, and that implemented um, thanks to the COP27 platform. Uh, that allows us to meet partners and mobilize resources that are painfully needed so that we can implement what I've been describing. Thank you, Mathieu. Merci beaucoup, Raoul. Uh, trouvé... Thank you very much. It was very interesting to, uh, to go to this regional level because we see that the, the CDAO defines its trajectory adaptation uh, strategy for 2050 uh, with an uh, with, uh, intermediary point in 2030, uh, with a uh, stage of uh, assessment. And it is uh, a challenge in terms of governance for a, uh, for a regional organization, because uh, it has its competences, it's a complement of uh, what the member states do. So they have to integrate not only the, the data uh, reporting at, uh, related to their own regional policies. Uh, so great bravo for uh, your efforts. Thank you very much for this uh, speech. Now, Mr. Bakafar, uh, there's something wrong at the right, at the, the worst, worst moment. You are f you are from Senegal uh, and the chief of the, the the commission for the the climate change. This is uh, this is about the plan, the integration of planification and the assessment of the adaptation and its efficiency. Uh, so let's see the. Thank you for giving me the floor, and I'm sorry for being late. Uh, I am moderating another s session in the Senegal Pavilion. So thank you very much for the invitation that had been uh, given to me only this morning, at, uh, two to two hours before the session, but I'll do my best. I will just tell you the, about the case of the integration. I will just give you the case of uh, the elaboration of uh, our national program, uh, we, which we call PN, P, PNA. Uh, and the question that was uh, tackled by my uh, uh, predecessor, uh, the, the, the currents between the, the, the scales, it's the inviting to, uh, to uh, inviting people to, to do something coherent to see how this aspect could be uh, determined. Uh, it's because we had a sectorial approach in Senegal. We we thought we we thought that the uh, the goal uh, will happen at, at the level of the uh, sectors. So uh, we ch we've chosen the uh, the specific uh, the, the sectoral approach, uh, and from the, from there we wanted to, to, to make a national document uh, from uh, the investments we get from the sectoral element. We don't step at the sectoral level. We only had to we also had to uh, to do studies at regional level level with the same sectors, and to see the specificities of the regions uh, uh, depending on this sector. The, 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 what was difficult was to how to make coherent all this because the sectorial national level uh, at this level we had uh, some uh, relevant information and viable information which was not uh, the case at the local level where we, we we didn't have viable data at all almost at all so how to do to uh, to, to to show this uh, cause effect effect uh, relationships and what are uh, what are the impacts of the climate change? So we acted uh, through uh, through uh, through a qualitative approach uh, by um, making uh, discussions of technical services. Even though there were no documents, these services had the memory of uh, past events. There were communities. 
and uh, resource persons who had uh, experience over the years. So we created a survey to, um, to get the data uh, about the resources and the, con the climatic context and try to uh, make the connection between the, uh, the, the, the potential consequences and uh, well, this ha actually climatically happened. So we then went higher to, ver to, uh, to sit with meteorological services at the national level to make sure that these links have existed. On the basis of this data, theoretical data or qualitative data, we've tried it to ponderate in order to quantify this data and to, to obtain something. And once uh, a original report uh, uh, is acquired, now we're trying to uh, make it coherent with the national scale. Of course, every region had its specificities. There were aspects that uh, were aligned with the, the national things, but but what we what we actually done what did was we took the aspect that was aligned with the uh, national priority to get more finances, and for the other things we've tried to we we proposed to reinforce the collectivities so uh, to create a, uh, to create a tool that would take account of their specificities. So now we're trying to uh, create a national document that will uh, uh, sum up all the options and identify the criteria to make a hierarchy of the options. So we have, we know what are the priorities. And based on these priorities, we've, we've, tried, we've created a plan uh, of priorities and we've shared it with the sectors that are supposed to integrate all these aspects in their planning planification politics for each sector uh, so the sectors had to validate uh, their reflections uh, products before share it once it validated at the sectorial level now uh, we're trying now to make the to compile all these sectors to get uh, a document uh, a national document this approach is uh, a little uh, not atypical that's what we what we chose in the Senegal. It's a challenge. I have to admit that it's it's not obvious. It's not easy, especially at the local level. We had uh, lots of problems to uh, establish the the uh, cause effect uh, links because usually it's stories told, nothing else. That's all the data. So we're not sure that it really has happened. So we have to go deeper in, uh, in order to try to. Uh, to establish these uh, cause-effect links. That is the approach we did at the national level for the integration of the aspects, uh, let's say the planification of the adaptation in the development policies. I don't know, do you have any other questions? Well, if you could tell us uh, uh, so a couple of words about the modalities when it comes to following up the efficiency of the adaptation actions in Senegal. Well, we, we've been thinking a lot about it, and with the support of the EFD and the uh, Adaptation Action Program, we've been able to elaborate a follow-up framework of the adaptation top uh, part of the, uh, of the NDCs, which wasn't easy. First, because we, we, need, we need to have climate sensitive indicators, plus the parameters are quite dynamic. So the question is whether you, you come up with uh, a relevant uh, index. How much do you need? How long do you have to measure? Who is going to take, to, uh, to take care of it? And you have the coordination part. You have to coordinate the, the information since each sector has its uh, follow-up framework, but it's also a classical one. My, my work uh, was about reinforcing the framework so that you don't give the feeling you are changing ways, but, but to take into consideration the climate-sensitive indicators uh, with the help of the experts that have been sent by the EFD. We've been working. It's still the beginning of the journey, but we know where we are heading at least. Uh, I didn't take my dogs with me. It's a pity, but we, for each sector, we have a couple of indicators, if you allow me. There is an uh, indicative framework to go towards the stabilization needs of that framework, which allows you to, to type, to drop the information. The logic is around coordinating to, 
to see which framework which should, should be implemented uh, that requires seas of coordination. There are seas of, of indicators and sectors. Um, when it comes to Senegal and adaptation, the Ministry of Environment is in charge. But now it's about how, how not to lose any information because it's not only, it's not only the sectorial uh, the, the sectors are uh, involved, the civil societies as well, the local authorities, uh, so that the reflection is now at this moment around the way we should uh, behave, not to lose, uh, to, um, to lose at least as less information as it gets, because we don't want to, uh, to overlook any. There are lots of efforts being made in terms of adaptation in Senegal, and we should know about it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fall. Uh, we see, well, as we listen to you, the uh, topic of, uh, of data gathering and how difficult it gets to have uh, exhaustive data, uh, comprehensive data. Um, it's extremely important, of course, because we have to uh, uh, evaluate things uh, when it comes to quantity. Uh, hence, the, uh, the, data gasp, the data gaps a bit. We know that adaptation is also about, about long-term thinking, about forecasts. We've been discussing a lot about Senegal in 2030 and in 2050. We, we know that the adaptation trajectory uh, is about being resilient in 2050. Vanuatu, Mr. Nelson Kato, uh, from the Environment Ministry, the Climate Change uh, the Department in Vanuatu, um, for you to tell us how uh, the long-term strategy that integrates forecasts about climate impacts, long-term or very long-term, this is it's about uh, to, uh, 20, uh, it, it's about impacts between adaptation and uh, how to enhance the follow-up and the efficiency of the adaptation thanks to uh, this strategic approach. Dr. Nelson Cato. Yeah, I'm, I'm switching from French to English because our uh, dear colleague is, is uh, going to speak in English. You have the floor, please. All right, thank you very much, um, AFD, for giving me this honor to present what we've been supported for as part of our long-term law emission development strategy. So, in brief, uh, Fanwatu is located in a geological zone within the South Pacific. Um, it is located in a prone area which is um, affected mostly by the impacts of climate change as well as natural disasters. And Fanwatu is being regarded globally as uh, one of the world risk nation to the impacts of climate change and disasters. Uh, just in recent, we experienced category five cyclones which shows how vulnerable uh, Fanwatu is with regards to climate change and natural disasters. So with regards to the Fanwatu's low, low emission development strategy, the vision of this development strategy is to reduce emissions across all sectors in a way that supports resilient, sustainable, equitable growth for its people. So therefore, climate change will impact Fanwatu's future so Donc la question qui, uh, qui vient à l'idée, c'est comment on va avant, avancer avec le, le, uh, de manière résiliente et durable quant à la lutte contre le changement climatique. Il y a des, uh, des, des rapports qui, qui, qui disent ce qui va se passer, scientifiques, je veux dire. Donc il faut uh, trouver uh, une résilience pour le futur à long terme. Donc les, euh, les projections climatiques enfin nous doux basent sur, euh, sur des scénarios différents. Euh, C'est des rapports ICB avec scénario 1, avec des baisses de, euh, des émissions, euh, de basses émissions, des émissions bas, ça c'est les, 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 les systèmes de séchage pour les femmes, pour l'âge et autres. Et pour, le, pour, les, pour les plantes, évidemment, c'est l'agriculture. Et tout ça dans le contexte de, de, de l'augmentation du niveau d'eau. Alors, plus ça, 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 ça va vers le nord, plus les conditions vont être changées avec... Euh, 
avec les émissions euh, de gaz à effet de serre, il va y avoir, il, il, ça va être de plus en plus euh, chaud avec euh, de la sécheresse. On va anticiper euh, euh, les, les changements euh, des conditions euh, de, de temps. Alors, dans notre stratégie de développement, il y a des, euh, des ateliers qui ont été infirminés euh, et finalisés en juin, euh, en août. Tout ça euh, se terminera en octobre. On va valider le tout. Ça inclut le public et le privé et les ONG qui font partie de ces projets. Euh, de ce... Et ils ont une influence sur la création d'une autre stratégie à long terme. Tout ça pour baisser les missions de CO2 conformément aux objectifs 2050. Nous avons besoin de, de secteurs et la mitigation, la résilience et l'adaptation euh, climat, au climat. Euh, C'est ce qu'on va identifier sur notre sentier de développement. D'autres choses sont euh, identifiées au cours de, de processus, l'intégration, les euh, l'adaptation, euh, l'immatriculation, tout ça, ça veut dire que ça... Euh, euh, ça veut dire qu'il faut le faire indépendamment de ce qui arrive. Ça, euh, la première chose qu'on fait, c'est euh, continuer les programmes existants et développer les politiques de transport national. Aussi une stratégie pour euh, l'agriculture pour qu'elle soit durable au niveau national. Le euh, processus que l'on fait, que l'on a amené par le développement de cette euh, stratégie et par le modeling de, euh, de ces aspects, on a euh, utilisé le modèle LIP, il y a une plateforme d'analyse qui nous, qui nous aide à cela. Il y a d'autres modèles qui ont été euh, développés pour la déforest déforestation, pour les, euh, le gaspillage des, euh, du bétail. Euh, conformément aux guidelines qui ont été formés, formés il y a des années. L'adaptation euh, climatique a aussi été modelée sur la base d'une un, évaluation de, de l'adaptation. Nous savons qu'il qu est difficile d'identifier de, 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 euh, même les objectifs. Donc, le, euh, donc le, la, la chose a été faite sur la base d'une approche qualitative. Ça, c'est quelques des éléments des, de notre, des, des sentiers d'adaptation pour l'Allemand euh, à question de, de, de basse émission et les trajectoires de développement de ces émissions, nous essayons de mitiger euh, et de, tout d'abord de, de voir ce, où on en est et quels sont les sentiers à choisir en termes d'électricité, l'utilisation de l'énergie, consommation, euh, la politique pour l'adaptation. Oui, euh, on a une stratégie, mais encore une fois, encore une fois quand il s'agit des trajectoires d'émissions, de, il ne sont que des stratégies que des stratégies. Pareil pour le transport, euh, il n'y a pas de, de vraie stratégie qui, euh, qui pourrait euh, promettre euh, une baisse d'émissions. Et euh, les, les émissions ne font que grandir. Euh, la même chose pour l'eau et, euh, et les déchets. Quand il s'agit de la résilience et de l'adaptation, il n'y a pas euh, de, stratégie, de stratégie qui concerne l'énergie et l'électricité. Quand on parle d'adaptation et de résilience, les capacités restent adaptatives, sont stables. Lorsque nous parlons de transport, la chose reste la même. On parle de mitigation. Il n'y a pas de stratégie. Il n'y a pas de capacité adaptative pour l'instant. Nous parlons aussi de, de, de santé. Il n'y a pas de stratégie claire dans ce domaine, du moins à cette étape, pour la résilience et pour l'adaptation. Mais... Euh, mais, mais euh, les capacités adaptatives se développent. Pour ce qui est euh, les pertes et, euh, et des, des, des pertes et des, euh, et des dommages, euh, nous sommes en train d'établir euh, la situation, le point de la situation. Nous identifions euh, de, nouvelles, de nouveaux accents, euh, des stratégies comme euh, les, euh, concernant les CDN. Donc, euh, 20 engagements en termes de mitigation, 
16 en termes d'adaptation et 12 euh, engagements de pertes et de dommages. Telle la situation pour les CEDAD. Donc, euh, pour les pertes et les dommages, euh, nous pensons euh, parler de euh, 160 millions, 110, 170 millions de, de dollars américains. Ensuite viendra, on parle d'adaptation euh, euh, comme partie du LITS. L'intégration de ces sujets, euh, il faut être accepté par les ministres. J'espère que ce sera euh, bientôt, euh, au début de l'année prochaine. Euh, ça sera publié en français et en anglais. Il y a des choses qui sont déjà en route. Euh, soutien de, de, du triple GI et la stratégie qui, euh, qui attend l'approbation de la gouvernement. Euh, on date une Wanadu, Wanadu et euh, ça va venir dans le, au mois de décembre, au début de l'année prochaine. Une note de concept sera aussi développée en termes de, de préparation pour euh, la mise en œuvre du LEDS. Et les engagements euh, de Wanadu, du, du, du partenariat, euh, vont aussi euh, se terminer par une note de, de concept qui va être bientôt financée. C'est provided through AFT, uh, in collaboration with Triple GI and New Zealand, qui supported Fanwadu financially to make sure that we have a joint uh, um, ledge documents which cap about both the adaptation and mitigation actions up to 2050. Again, uh, thank you very much AFT for giving this honor to present Fanwadu's uh, ledge which supported through the AFT. Thank you very much. Enlightening. Thank you so much. On voit qu'on se projette. We see that it's uh, it's very long-term thinking and holistic thinking, since we combine mitigation and adaptation uh, on all the in all the sectors. So that we better build arrangements so that we can follow up results when it comes to adaptation. What strikes me is the fact that thanks to that long-term thinking. Uh, has been able to uh, identify uh, commitments when it comes to uh, to losses. Uh, uh, few countries has have done so, and that raises questions about the way we could minimise as much as it gets the uh, the losses, but also poor adaptation that could lead to. Uh, to, to some, yet some other losses. We, we might talk about it later during another uh, panel, perhaps. I would like to, to hear Mr. Christophe Benketz. He's a research director within the AFD. He's going to talk about a program that uh, tries to combine scientific knowledge, data, and luck with local local knowledge. We've talked about a lot about data gathering that can be done uh, several ways. Uh, Boubaka has told about it told about it as well. But now this is more about this will be more about can you hear me? Because I, I can't hear I can't hear a thing I don't know. Yes indeed we hear you. We do hear you. Do you hear me now? No. You don't look like you don't look like you are hearing us but um, we are going to talk about the way we can reinforce evaluation, the follow-up of the adaptation measures. You are in New Caledonia at the moment. Thank you for accepting to take part in this in this meeting. Uh, not sure you could hear us. I can hear you. I heard the last sentence, but if we, you're very quiet. Well, yes, you were saying we are happy that you are taking part in the in the debate. I was um, inviting you to take the floor and to come along with your presentation. Could you present your project? Yes, of course, I'd be happy to do so. The Eclipsa project is a regional project uh, which aims at, I can't see my slide, by the way, but it's about climate change, about sectoral impact and adaptation policies. It's a re an applicative, uh, applicative 
research, an applied research project. I can't see my slides, uh, unfortunately, but it's a regional project. It's, uh, it concerns the overseas uh, territories, uh, the French ones. It's a collaboration between the uh, AFD, the uh, IRD, and Meteo France. C will you be able to switch my slides on back? Because I, I don't know everything by heart. It's far more comfortable for me to be able to show the, the slides. Thank you. So we are home again. Right. So this project, it's fundamental research uh, and applied research. So that's about supporting countries when it com comes to their adaptation, national plans. The original thing, and the cool thing is, as you see, you see three labels at the bottom. You can see the left one. Uh, what we usually use is not is not uh, applicable when it comes to the smallest countries and especially to these small insular islands like Wallis and Futuna. The climate modeling can't see this as you see. This, you see the, this big square on the left. You can't see nothing. So it's about making the provision, uh, the forecasting tools more accurate so that you get what you see on the right. You get something that is adapted to the scale of the smallest islands. So you go from one, uh, a 100 kilometer scale to something far more accurate so that you can come up with different scenarios, which is key and fundamental if you want to understand what you are going to adapt to. Because before getting adapted to something, you have to know what the risk skis so you try to reproduce simulations like 20 kilometers around an island or an archipelago like New Caledonia what is all ways and Fortuna or others next slide please so first things first we're going to produce those uh, the climate forecasting and create some uh, Climate, impact, climate change impacts with the uh, sectorial impacts. Those sectorial impacts has to be have to be determined. This is what my colleague has been talking about uh, earlier, and this will be done via meetings, which have been launched already with local authorities and and states during a collective intelligence meeting, so that we simultaneously produce simultaneously with uh, with uh, scientists. Uh, some indicators about the way uh, local authorities and populations streamline the uh, climate risk in their everyday life and what those what priorities should be uh, according to them when it comes to adaptation in the future. All these data will be um, made available on, on climate portals in cooperation with the uh, with the spread its original organization. One of the part of the project is about giving a uh, providing uh, support uh, after it has been given to the local authority, the governments of the Vanuatu, of course, but also New Caledonia, French Polynesia, plus Wallace and Futuna. Next slide, please. Um, I think we missed one slide, or perhaps we jumped it, overlooked it. Okay, sorry, my bad, perhaps. Uh, thank you, Christophe, we can hear you. I, I hear you as well, but uh, Christophe, th there are lots of noise around, around us. That's the reason. But feel free to add something. We, we're not in a hurry. So if you would, uh, if, you, if, you should, if you could or would or want to add something about the adaptation, the tools, you, you still have some time. We're okay with time. Well, th the process is quite uh, complicated because the process that has to be implemented is what has been described by my colleague from Senegal. It's about producing climate simulations at a scale that doesn't exist for now. And then you have to set sectorial priorities so that you know what the consequences are for several sectors. So uh, for a given a kind of agriculture, let's say, in, uh, in the Pacific Ocean. And it has to be consistent for the, the countries that are concerned for a given geographical area. The, the, the priorities differ from one area to the other. So it's about making things consistent between the needs of various countries. Uh, you have this uh, 
project dimension that is li limited. So that's one of the pitfalls, one of the things uh, we have to, uh, one of the tasks we have to, to get started with in the upcoming years. It's a four-year uh, prospect. Thank you. Thank you, Christophe. We will have the occasion to, uh, to, to pop up later during, the, during the, the round table, of course, and to take part. Uh, I would like now the Ferdis to, uh, the Ferdi, the F-E-R-D-I, to take the floor. Uh, Mathieu will, uh, will tackle upon this uh, topic when it comes to physical vulnerability, vulnerability and the usefulness of such uh, measurements when it comes to uh, to um, providing money to the most vulnerable vulnerable countries. Mathieu, you are accountable for the International Financement Programme for the FERDI, and you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mathieu. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, allowing me to participate in the discussion. As Mathieu just said, I'm going to uh, present you uh, an indicator that uh, allows to uh, better target the financements uh, connected with the adaptation. It's a work that has been started that more than 10 years ago, uh, started by uh, Catherine Simonet, who's made introduction uh, here and who's now a member of the AFD and the FRD. We have a long tradition of works on the uh, allocation of uh, development and financing. It was therefore natural that we also work on the uh, uh, climate uh, financing. So I will tell you about the spirit, we'll not talk about technicalities. Uh, it's, uh, it's not the, the right moment. But I want you to know that uh, in two days, the, uh, the architect, the technician who has been working on this, uh, uh, who came after Catherine Simonet, will be present in COP. Uh, and he's going to sh talk about it on Monday uh, uh, during another side event. In the few minutes that uh, I have been given, I will just tell you why and for what uh, an, indi an indicator. I will present that briefly and uh, what are the, its, uh, what is the, its usage and the prospects for it. Now, uh, for what? You know that one of the major uh, subjects discussed here in the COP is the com financial compensation uh, paid uh, to uh, the poorer countries or developing countries uh, by the rich countries so they can adapt uh, because they are they suffer of the uh, huge losses because of the climate change and they are not uh, they are not responsible for the accumulation of the of the CO2 uh, for, for, for years uh, that, that was due to countries that are developed now. Behind this debate there is a, there is a, a need for uh, equity and fairness. We're talking a lot about this subject of compensations for, for historical reviews. There's, uh, there's not reports about it uh, with uh, very uh, serious works that talk about two billion not 2,000 uh, billion a year, and so on and so on. That this money has to be dedicated to this. Well, these figures, uh, I don't think uh, the international community will immediately adhere to uh, to this to these uh, figures. But I think that during these discussions and uh, in future discussions, uh, uh, certain en envelope uh, in terms of money will be adopted. It will be probably lower than uh, what is announced in the uh, in the reports that we've seen uh, we've been seeing uh, lately and this transfer will have to be when it comes to adaptation and this compensation for the damages uh, will have to be uh, unconditional and uh, and uh, with cr uh, clear criteria criteria like vulnerable vulnerability uh, so an indicator uh, I'm coming to it what, we pro what we've been proposing for years an indicator of vulnerability physical vulnerability to uh, to the climate change um, which will allow to allocate uh, among countries in a relevant way 
among countries, but also inside the countries. The type of uh, indicators like this one uh, allows also to assess what is called the selectivity of the help of the assistance. So we are sure that uh, the money goes where the countries are more, the more vulnerable. APCC is a, it's a, it's an English uh, uh, PVCCI. Uh, it's uh, an English acronym. Why such an indicator? There is a huge offer to, uh, of indicators. Uh, some uh, for ten years. Uh, there's been a lot of work done on this. Uh, 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 questions: What we can see in the offer? In the offer, we can see it's very limited uh, in terms of, of, of meanings and of uh, reception. And they exist to uh, to, um, to raise awareness in the public. Uh, there's tons of indicators, and only for the environment. Uh, when we're talking about the uh, uh, funding for adaptation. There's also the adaptive capacity. This is this not very clear, but it's been defined depending on differently uh, between institutions, depending on the indicators, actually. And then, and then uh, these indicators are not very transparent, and it's very difficult to reproduce to uh, the, the results obtained. Now, the opposite. What is a good indicator, index, let's say? It's an index that uh, uses a limited number of components. This is very important. This is how all the major uh, UN indicators that are being used for the allocation are the things that have been uh, built for uh, tens, for long years now. Um, and then, when it comes to vulnerability to uh, climate change, it has to be, and I want to emphasize this, it has to reflect the structural vulnerability. I'm saying vulnerability, I emphasize this, that, that means uh, a really exogenous uh, uh, vulnerability. vulnerability. So uh, people, re uh, countries receive shocks, but not due to their own politics, recent politics, something that is not dependent on the politics. This is what I called uh, structural uh, vulnerability. And the index we propose uh, is uh, conformant to this criteria. As I said, it's a, it's a work that's been perfected for tens of years and has been published in a very well-known uh, paper. Uh, can you see the graph? Yes. Here we go. Uh, I will not get into technical details. What you can see, for, in the case of this index, it follows the, the, the logics uh, of the UN, when, when those who know what I am talking about. So it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's an index very used by the UN. This index has five components. And it covers two types of risks. Long-term risk, first of all, uh, connected with progressive shock like floods due to, uh, to, the, height, uh, to the heighting of um, waters and the risk connected with the de desertification. And we also have the second type of risks of, uh, of intensification of uh, and, uh, increasing aridity uh, as the temperatures are not stable. Uh, we have uh, storms and other and rainfalls. I'll stop the technique, uh, te te uh, the technique right now. There is an index to exposition to shock and an index it, it, that uh, takes uh, account of the size of the shocks. So uh, this, let's say, marriage of these two dimensions of shocks makes the index very interesting. I will uh, then, well, if you want, we can talk about the, the technicalities, but I will uh, first of all show you the results. We have uh, results that we uh, measure at the country level and at subnational level. We've, uh, we've, we've been doing that in 191 uh, member countries of the UN, mostly Africa, and also on the small uh, developing um, islands like Vanuatu. We underline the fact that there's a great diversity in Africa uh, and that we, uh, we recommend uh, 
that our index should be uh, adopted at the level, at the national level, not in groups of level, uh, not in groups of countries, because they are very different. At the local level, uh, we also work on locally. I've presented you the uh, Africa's uh, map for the sub-national indicators. We take in the second subnational level, which gives us something like 47,000 administrative units, and it's relevant for countries that are characterized by high geoclimatic diversity. Uh, it's also interesting for the, the countries to want the to plan the allocation of the uh, help uh, assistance for, uh, project. When it comes to the use and the prospect, we said the prospect. The prospect is a question of allocation. Uh, in other words, how when can we do we uh, allocate help in a relevant way and a fair way, and how we can assess the selectivity of the of the assistance to make sure that, that the money is sent uh, to the to the place where um, it's really needed. Uh, we worked lots of countries, but amongst uh, others in Madagascar, and this uh, index has been uh, used for the local uh, allocation of uh, adaptation product. This index is uh, very used uh, in research. Now we use it not only us, but for an analysis of the impact of, uh, of uh, climate change on uh, conflicts. This is becoming very interesting, quite frankly. It's been used uh, by the Asian Bank of Development uh, together with the, the, the African Bank. And I would like to, uh, to finish here because this uh, index is uh, mentioned uh, by uh, in the ministerial discussions. Yes, has been mentioned by, uh, by the small islands. And the works uh, that I present to you uh, feed the works of the UN uh, that we've been assisting uh, for a year now on a vulnerability multidimensional index that the UN will probably adopt. Uh, they work, they've been working on it for months with our technical help and the works. It's about technical, social and political uh, uh, dimensions. So I'm saying this is all been fed by the works that I present. I hope that I haven't been too long. Thank you for your attention. Merci beaucoup, Mathieu. Thank you, Mathieu. I'll, what I'll take home, among others, is the, the multidimensional uh, aspect. Uh, I'm a negotiator, so that echoes, of course, uh, many things when it comes to operation, op operating, uh, reconciliating the national level with the global level. I've heard Alexandre when he was saying about t talking about connecting different levels, different scales. You, Professor, while you were talk when mentioning the various geographical dimensions, uh, dimensions that have to be um, conciliated. This, that leads us to developing many tools, methods, practical methods, economic tools, so that we are able to uh, ev evaluate uh, the way money is spent and provided. Uh, how do you see how to combine, what do you think about combining those different tools? Alexandre was talking about, was saying we have to, to, to talk the same language, and I think this is extremely important, because if we are to follow up and evaluate efficiency, uh, thinking about the future and coordinating international cooperation, uh, well, I, I think you, you should, you, you could and should react upon that. Uh, Alexandre, you'll be the first victim of my question. Thank you. Well, uh, the next, that's the next question we are about to ask and that we'll have to ask until now what we've witnessed is what's on the table when it comes to understanding and following up the evaluation. It's not enough. We, we are not there. It doesn't mean the expectations and the needs. So we, we'll need various types of approaches to gather various types of data so that we can treat treat it in various ways and we become able to find the light. 
So uh, now how to cross things, that's yet another question and yet other crossroads. But about la common language, that's a question that, that has got to be asked. There are various approaches now, various methods. You see what Christophe and Mathieu have talked about. Those are interesting approaches, but they are very uh, uh, data, um, uh, data consuming. They tell us a part of the risk, a, a, a part of the fortuitous aspect of things. Uh, but there are all, all other methods like the gut track or what Senegal is doing and that's very interesting because it's fast perhaps less accurate but faster so it's it's also interesting so uh, it, both are fine uh, it's either you make it simple and fast or you make it accurate but slow and both are interesting uh, both are interesting, both are, and, and no, nothing is perfect, of course, but it might be complementary. Thank you, Alexandre. Uh, it, it's continuous. Uh, Raoul, would you like to, to add a word from the CEDEAO perspective, prospect? Uh, what do you think? It's a, quite a, a young strategy. Uh, and it requires a certain amount of uh, implementations, what do you say? Uh, thank you, Mathieu. When it comes to the CEDAO and most African countries, the, the question of data is a central one. We talk about a common language, a common language when it comes to vulnerability analysis. We've seen and we've talked about the, the, the tool that is uh, used and developed which tool can be extremely helpful but it's also about the uh, the issue uh, of uh, the real reliability of the data of data if you want to have good adaptation options you need to have a good a proper vulnerability uh, study done uh, and that's uh, when it's coming to it every each time you talk about adaptation there is data to it. This is what you need. So I, I think this all is very nice, looks great. But it's about you, w w in order to conduct proper analysis, you know, for all the, the projects that are developed at this point, you always need analysis and data to make it operational. Uh, when it comes to projects, when it comes to the adaptation fund. So I think these tools might prove helpful and complementary so, and extremely handy when it comes to, uh, to the CEDAO. As I was saying, you can do more focus when it comes to put more the focus on adaptation than it has been done. Uh, until 2030 and the revision of the strategy, we need tools so that we can uh, conduct proper vulnerability analysis so that we can propose the, the appropriate uh, adaptation measures ad adapted to, uh, uh, to the reality in a given country, in a given place. Um, the question that I've asked to the predecessors. Basically, what, you have adopted a long-term vision, uh, you're following a, a long-term approach, uh, where you said that uh, the assessment of adaptation was, for the time being, very much qualitative uh, for, for the time being, but it could, should be improved uh, over time. So what would the next steps for you in terms of uh, uh, choosing the right indicators and in terms of methodology? Thank you very much. Uh, with regards to the implementation of this, um, as I already mentioned through my presentation, that uh, from our side, Vanuatu Tata is also a challenge. We cannot quantify the adaptation targets. As um, uh, as far as we have the vulnerability assessment and the tools will be made available, systems made available in country, which will allow us to define the better actions, adaptation actions to, to address the challenge. And for a country like Vanuatu, we cannot go away with disasters, climate impacts, natural disaster, um, the impacts that we will face from cyclones, flooding, and other related disaster. So therefore, data is a very important which 
will pave way for us to define our actions to the future and also supports that will be provided for to make sure that in the future we do uh, implement programs to address the mission of this long-term strategy. Otherwise, we do have strategy in place, but people are still facing impact. So therefore, data instruments will be made available to make sure that we measure our progress, our strength, see where we are, and we progress forward from there to up to 2050, which will see where Fanodu is with regards to building resilience to the impacts of climate change. Thank you. Mathieu, would you, would you like to add something when it comes to the question I asked in the introduction? But of course, when it comes to the research, your question uh, bears uh, without many dimensions to it. Uh, as Alexandre was saying during the introduction, we all are, we, when I say we, we all small institutions. So we can't, we can't change the world being on our own. We have to, to work together. We have to engage other stakeholders. The COP27 is a good occasion. It uh, seems there are 40,000 of us during the week. I'm not sure we'll meet each other, all of us, because that's a lot, 40,000 people. So we won't have a chat with each and everyone here, but we need catalyzers such as the United Nations. We work a lot with the UN because that's a natural pathway, isn't it? But it's not always adapted to all the, to all the kind of works, all the methods, all the workforces. But you can't wait for the solutions to come, to, uh, to come off from the sky or from the, to, to fall off a tree. Uh, it's not that simple. When it comes to research, when it comes to, to universities, when you look at the, the uh, scientific works, the trainings, there are many, many more showing up that are focusing on the climate. So it's, it's good news. It shows we're on the right pathway. We, we know that people are, the, the public is more and more concerned, more and more. Uh, but, but, but at the same time, if you look at the results of the elections, um, even in, in the best democracies, you can be a bit worried. So there are, there is, there are messages that should be sent. And this is not about fear-mongering. Fear-mongering is one of the leverages, leverages, of course, but not the best one. Uh, it's about providing people with, uh, with messages like, you know, I, I think we're going, we might get along. It's not like there is no hope. We might get along, but that requires work. Uh, as Alexandre was saying, uh, via the strategies you are uh, creating and implementing, to answer your question, it won't be simple, and there is not one answer. There are hundreds of thousands of it. I'm uh, answering like somebody from Normandy, and I'm perfectly aware of it. But yes, when it comes to using the, uh, the tools, I think it's essential, but our tool is what it is, so that you need quality data to feed it. If you don't have quality data, the result, the fruit that will come of the tree will be ill, will be flawed. So that's it's about the av availability of quality data. You need quality data to, uh, to know where you are and where you are heading. We, ha we need to have a chat look by the way later because what you are doing is highly interesting for me I'm deeply interested when it comes to vulnerability and adaptation but we are limited as we see that's what we are realizing when it comes to finding quality data Alexandre what you are saying is extremely relevant uh, we are we are doing fast we uh, the difference is we are less accurate and faster because that's what we need uh, we have no time but that allows us to put in place a, um, a data gathering system that allows us to cooperate, cooperating with the meteorological services and, uh, and analysis laboratories to uh, modelize some scenarios so that we can uh, go closer to the local level because it's empty there. We lack the simulations so that each time we talk about adaptation is often reactive, not proactive, but just reactive because you don't plan things. You don't, you don't forecast, uh, you don't think long term because you don't have the, that possibility. You keep reacting, but you don't, you don't have the initiative. You can't be proactive, you react. It's merely about reacting, which we do as fast as we can, but it's also but still reacting. 
Um, so we need references, we need proofs, we need evidence about, about what's happening now based upon what we could for, come, off, come, off, come up with forecasts, but that requires a solid basis so that the forecast for the future will be perhaps not accurate but, if, but sufficiently quickly made. I think we've heard that on the basis of a continuous improvement approach, this is where we are. We don't do it from one day to another, especially to, to, uh, when it comes to creating an index of vulnerability. But uh, this allows me to give, give the floor to Jan uh, Claude Benkes, yeah, who's worked on the connection in different spaces uh, uh, on the basis of uh, simulations and of solutions based on data collected on, on, in the, on the ground. I don't know if you are still with us, because I see another name. So if you're not with us, I will uh, maybe, I'm turning to, uh, to the audience, maybe there are comments or uh, questions from the participants to our, uh, to our speakers. Yes, please. Just. Hi. Uh, can, can you just introduce yourself, yes. please? Thank uh, Raid Muslin from the International Actuarial Association. And um, pa pardon, Anglais, pardon. <laughs> Uh, for the gentleman from Vanuatu, a question. If you have a limited amount of money to spend, say, to rebuild after a big cyclone, how do you decide between, say, rebuilding 10,000 homes poorly or 5,000 homes well that will withstand the next cyclone and survive adaptation? Because you have limited money and how well you spend the money on good construction makes a big difference in the long run, but costs more. Voilà, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. I congratulate uh, our speakers for their presentations. My question is how to pilot the climatic measures. This is complicated, it's difficult, because from my point of view, uh, there are, it's difficult, especially in Sahel, because the Sahel, uh, that's a very fragile ecosystem that has been already impacted. Now that people finally talk about it with different uh, engagement for 15 years and nothing is being done, I see reflections uh, on uh, on the ground done, even though uh, the science, uh, the, the researchers do not send uh, their students, maybe maybe to Senegal, yes, but not to uh, the Sahel, Nigeria or uh, Mali. I would be amazed. That should be a global approach. Uh, rather than just puncture. This way I would see. I'm Haruna Barshi. I'm uh, systematically in all these uh, places, especially FRDI. Thank you. Is there uh, another question? Yes. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to thank the speakers. Uh, Mr. Kugala, I'm coming from Togo. After listening uh, the speakers, I heard that there is a bad uh, data management that does, don't allow to elaborate a good viable tool. So you will say that in many of our countries, the data management is a problem, a crucial problem, as you've said earlier. We would have uh, to act in, in a way uh, that, feel, that countries feel concerned. We have to reorganize internally before talking about the regional organization. If you have concrete proposals to, uh, to do for our countries, uh, to, to countries to don't fa make efforts in this uh, direction. That would be welcome. So every each, each one of us uh, could propose when we back. Uh, sort of uh, archiving data is difficult for our structures. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, and I congratulate the, um, the, the panelists. I'm from, I'm from Chad. I wanted to say something about the tools. Maybe I'm wrong, but I have the impression that usually the, the tools are developed uh, by uh, uh, researchers from north, north of countries of the north, and they, they are not necessarily adaptable in our countries. Implementable. Shouldn't we have a tool uh, that could uh, accept different types of entries? We have a data problem, a uh, quality data problem. We, should, we need to have a, a tool that would not accept certain data. So we can confirm it with just some data because when I saw the tool and uh, the PBCC, I, I can't see, for example, uh, the question of dust, for example, uh, the, colleague, the colleague from Niger uh, was talking about uh, Sahel problems. We have other data that comes and that come, and we don't know where to enter it. Should we have a tool that would accept all the data, the data that uh, and the data uh, that we don't have, we can do without them. We'll have to stop now because uh, uh, we need time to answer. Who would like to uh, to start? Nassan, could you like to start? Thank you very much. I mean, I, I can't um, agree much with you with regards to the, the thank you for the question. And um, yeah, we know that Vanuatu is, is, is a small country with a very small GDP in terms of uh, how the, the GDP contributes to the, uh, the country itself. So therefore, with, re with regards to how we, we could manage that, I mean, we do uh, have the at the moment, they, they are kind of building up a, a policy which will allow for like a, res a resilient, uh, stronger buildings. But again, we acknowledge the fact that we do have traditional way of how we could um, accommodate those systems. And we understand the fact that those we, we, when we, we are into the art infrastructure, which will be cost very much. Um, and this is th those buildings can be wiped out in five or, or uh, ten minutes when we're talking about category five cyclone or a flash flood. But again, we have to acknowledge that a country like Vanuatu, in terms of this, its adaptive capacity, we all highly value the traditional ways of how we live, as in the past. But we also acknowledge that maybe in the, in, in the meantime, that there is the differences in terms of climate conditions from the past and now. So therefore, we're slowly um, accommodating some of the practice, um, matching both other traditional knowledge and science to make sure that it fits well to the national or circumstances of Anodu. Otherwise, if we go one-sided, it will be very costly for us. So we both kind of matching traditional knowledge of how we're going to adapt to those situations, as well as tying up with the science. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nelson. Um, Mathieu, je vous en prie. Uh, Mathieu. Yes. Uh, all right. Oh, there was that question. Uh, you, you've, you talked about the Sahel. That's a region uh, I value, a region I, I love. I've been in Ouagadougou. That's a, there's a, ch a chair there um, around working on environment. Um, and the question of data is key. I, I remember when you were saying that students don't go to the Sahel when it comes to the, the Serdi. The, the uh, research center in which I work, that's not true. Uh, most of our students, apart those from the uh, areas, it's, I mean, there are some places like Bamako where it's quite, you know, you don't send students there because it's dangerous. But the center has existed, has been existed for about 45 years and many students have been sent to the Sahel or to Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and uh, I have to add that uh, many of them were not French, by the way. Uh, they, they sometimes came from emerging countries, developing countries. But the data are key, of course. Data is key. Our unit in Ouagadougou, Burkina Faso, um, is aware of it. 
but you know how expensive it is, how expensive it is to gather data locally. But that's something we keep on doing. We try to do so at least. There's a study we are conducting in Niger uh, at the moment. Some data is less accessible. Some, uh, not all the local data uh, make it to the capital city. So they have to hire people locally who gather data about development, about health, about education, using their smartphones, taking pictures, uh, conducting census, uh, counting uh, deaths, uh, counting trees, counting pupils uh, in the schools, and gathering data that are not available uh, if you go to, 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 the, uh, to the ministries. So the, the, the World Bank, of course, does it. But, uh, but when it comes to our small unit, it's also some, sometimes you, something you can do. But it's, it's tricky and it's expensive. Somebody asked a question about, what was it? Uh, the, yes, the, the, somebody was saying that uh, these, those are works performed by people from the Northern Hemisphere. There is a, a, a guy from Guinea who will, join, who, who will be joining us in two days. And I don't think that's sometimes something you can say about our works. But I, I, I understand that's a critical voice. There are dimensions, there are things, there are things that cannot be take, considered when it comes to the... Sometimes you need standardized indicators so that to be useful in, so that you compare countries, but that's the question. Some, somebody, you, you need, you need some, something completely standardized so that you compare all the, con the countries, but when you get, when you get it, you say, hey, it's, it's, it's a one size fits all, so that it doesn't take into consideration all the, all the differences. Okay, you can do both. We propose something standardized, but of course, countries differ from one to another. I agree with you. You can't, you can't, um, I'll be in, I would like to, to have a chat with uh, the, the gentleman who was asking about Sahel earlier. Sorry for running. Uh, our friend from Chad was asking a question as well, uh, and Alexandre would like to answer, but then we'll have to stop because we, because we, have, to, we have to leave the place very quickly. Uh, data is, uh, you know, people tend to say data is a pitfall, but is key. You can't say both. Uh, it can't be at, at once uh, tw both uh, a bottleneck and what you need most, uh, practically speaking. Uh, I've, I've, I've been very surprised uh, uh, along the years working on small islands because I see there are lots of knowledge. We don't always uh, forecast, we don't always think long term like you know, what will be in 80 years. But the risk factors are huge. So you can apply things to a long-term vision, but could you apply those even on, on the, the mid-term or, or the short-term? It's already updation and it's already quite handy. So I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want you to, to, go, to go home after this, uh, this round table thinking, okay, the, what we have to take home is no data, no decision. That's not the takeaway. That's not the conclusion. Okay, thank you for this no conclusion. And see you later.
Thank you. Ok, on va commencer. Euh, Madame la Ministre. Uh, Mrs. Minister, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome. I am Patrick Goffre and I'm a counselor at the uh, permanent presentation uh, of France in Geneva at the UN and other uh, international councils in Switzerland, where I'm the delegate of France within the uh, VDD, the platform of displacement. I would like to wish you all uh, Welcome on the French Pavilion for this uh, event, event uh, entitled Building Resilient uh, Cities in, in the Era of change, uh, Climatic Changes and of Migrations from the point, with the point, point of view of the youth. The, uh, the, the event will be moderated by Caroline de Dumas, a former uh, ambassador uh, for the migration and for climatic action. The event will be divided into uh, panels, uh, a high-level uh, segment to talk about institutional framework, political framework, and then a second panel to give exa operational examples of actions, how to develop approaches and solutions to reinforce the resilience and to mitigate the risk for the population uh, to better integrate the youth uh, distribution and finally to transform uh, a fragility into an opportunity. Caroline Dubas will uh, present us uh, the panelists, but first of all I will give pass the floor to the ambassador François Vanville who is going to uh, open this event. Mr. Ambassador, uh, the floor is yours. Madam Minister, uh, Mayor of Freetown, who's going to appear on video in a few moments, uh, ladies and gentlemen ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen panelists, dear partners and representatives of international organizations of civil society and youth, ladies and gentlemen. France, France, along with the OIM, is delighted to be able to invite you today to contribute to the discussions on the relationship between climate change, migration, and sustainable city, cities. To address this topic, we felt it was essential to include the perspective of youth in today's discussion. Youth is a key actor in, a cli in climate change and migration, both because they are directly affected by climate change and because they will be confronted with, even, with it even more severely in the coming decades, but also because they uh, are a particular active group of actors concerned with providing sustainable solutions. Climate change and the increase in natural disasters represent a huge challenge for cities. 
cities must face the economic and social risks resulting from climate change with the objective of prote protecting the most vulnerable people and all those who take refuge there. Among the social risks, many are those related to human mobility. Far from being an issue of the future, climate change related mig migration is already one of the main causes of forced displacements in the world. Thus, the climate migration nexus is an emerging issue that must be studied in greater depth at the international level. In particular, it is necessa necessary to better anticipate what we call environmental migrations and the needs that arise from it. France is very involved in the climate migration nexus. Between 2019 and 2020, it, will, it, it held the presidency of the platform of displacement uh, called the PDD. The PDD, a platform, state platform uh, of states seeking to develop synergies uh, with OEIM, ACNUR, and other Geneva based organizations, actively advocates for good practices and concrete solutions to first, reduce the risk of displacement, two, help people at risk not to migrate through adaptation measures, and three, for those who cannot stay put to assist them in their displacement. At the junction of several global agendas, the Sendai framework, the Paris Agreement, the Global Compact on Migration and Refugees, the DP successfully pushes the theme and this cross-cutting thinking in the various UN mechanisms. Beyond cooperation between states, effective action requires consult consultation with the other levels of governance, in particular with the local level, which will be more than ever in the front line. Aware of this, France considers that multi-level governance is today the most appropriate form of political response to the challenges of migration in general and rental migration in particular. This is one of the thematic priorities of the Global Forum on Migration and the Development, the FGMD, which France co-chairs with Senegal since last June. In terms uh, in the governance of the environmental displacement, we believe that cities are faced with two imperatives, to prevent and to accommodate. To prevent on the one hand by limiting the push factors that uh, lead to forced displacement by combating climate change and by developing their resilience to accommodate, on the other hand, by offering a sustainable refuge to the environmentally displaced people. This implies being able to respond to the needs of these new populations, in particular by guaranteeing them access to basic rights and services. The number, numerous climate, climate disasters that have marked uh, this 2022 have reminded that the extent to, it, to, to which cities are the first re refuges. In short, to face the challenges of climate and induce mobility, it is imperative that we meet as we do today, imperative that we begin to define the framework for concerted action. We believe that good practices already exist. And they are simply they uh, simply need to be highlighted, systematized, and coordinated. We are therefore pleased to welcome today panelists who will be able to share their findings and recommendations with us. Uh, we are also pleased pleased to include to this panel the World Bank, whose work on environmental and climatic displacement is a reference today along with the, the, those of the OIM, which recently published an institutional strategy on migration, environment and climate change 2021-2030 to address the emerging challenges of climate change and environmental degradations and their consequence, uh, consequence at local, national, regional and international levels on population displacement. We hope that this panel will allow, in a similar spirit, to outline the state of the art of practices uh, and knowledge and deduce some recommendations, both in terms of national actions and transnational inter-actor cooperation. We hope that this discussion will fed into the work of the FGMD and the 14th summit of the 
of the Global Forum on Migration and Development. Environmental migration will be the main theme of this summit. I would like to thank my colleague Patrick Offray, the teams of IOM, uh, AFPCNT, the French Association for the Prevention of Natural and Technological Disasters. Also, uh, my colleagues from ADEM, the French Environment and Energy Management Agency, and all our partners for organizing this panel as well as we do participants in this exchange, panelists and observers. With no further ado, I would I wish you uh, two fruitful sequences and invite you to participate actively uh, in the discussions. Thank you. I thank you all. Thank you very much, Excellency. I will now give the floor to Caroline Dumas, uh, today's debate moderator. Hello, uh, Madam Minister, uh, Chair Director, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants who uh, accepted to take part in today's discussion being connected online with no further ado and without repeating what our ambassador just said, I think it's important to to tackle the main topic of this debate, which is the major impact of climate change uh, and its consequences for the populations, broadly speaking. The last uh, IPCC report stated quite um, with no uh, uncertain terms that climate change is a threat poses a threat both to the planet and to, to the human beings. Uh, in a, there, are certain, there is a certain amount of situations all over the world where it is a, a matter of life or death. So that hence the need to streamline the impact, the consequences for the, for the people, for the urban populations, especially in Africa, since Africa is one of the most affected continents, both by climate change in, its, uh, in both its dimensions. Uh, there is the, uh, the slow onset, the, the droughts and the floods, and there is the fast onset with the, with the floods, uh, the storms, uh, hurricanes, that add to the to the scarcity of water and the uh, desertification. Those events um, are a threat for the affected populations. And the question the question now is double. There is the, the resilience, the population's resilience question, but also it's it's also about protecting the most vulnerable, and especially those who have been displaced, who were forced to leave their, uh, the countries and regions where they originated from, who, can't, who couldn't uh, keep on living where their parents and grandparents lived and were buried, who had have to, to go to great heights and lanes to, uh, some, sometimes to remain. Uh, very often those people are now seeking a new life, a new way of being, a new way of life, and a new jobs in the cities. Uh, when it comes to, to, to the coastal areas in Africa, we know that there is a high degree of vulnerability. We know that we have 1,000 kilometers coast, long, a long coast of megalopos between Lagos and Abidjan, uh, with tens of million people living there in those urban uh, Areas. So I think the interest of this debate is uh, around the need of consultation at the level state, at the local, at the national level, at the regional level. But it's about uh, getting together uh, various levels of governance together with the affected populations, together with the affected people the main city's inhabitants, of course, but this event has also been uh, organized 
uh, in cooperation with the French government, but with the uh, uh, IOM as well, the International Organization uh, of Migration, in order to integrate, in order to streamline the, the, uh, the, the migrants, migrating people. So the, the aim now of, of this panel will be to try to find the means, the solutions, the tools, uh, so, so that we can reinforce the dialogue between uh, the states and the civil societies, uh, the migrating people, uh, above all, and perhaps to come up with some answers. We are not, we are not set to, to change the world in one hour or to, to, to carry out a big revolution, but that's about going beyond risk reduction and how to transform vulnerabilities, the blatant vulnerabilities into sources of opportunities. Two panels inside one, as Patrick just mentioned a moment ago. It's a great honor for me to introduce Ms. Lelia, Lalia Camara, Minister of Environment and Sustainable Development for uh, Mauritania. Ms. Uh, Miriam Merad, Director of Research and Professor in the CNRS, the Centre National de Recherche Scientifique French, the National Centre of Scientific Research, Dr. Simeon Ehoui, uh, Regional Director for Central and, and Western Africa at the uh, World Bank, and uh, Freetown's Mayor, Ms. Yvonne Aki Sawyer. She is also accountable for the C40 MMC Global Mayors Task Force upon Climate and Migration plus Mr. Cédric Bourrier, General Director for Risks uh, Prevention at the, uh, ecology, at the Environment Transition Ministry uh, in France. I'm going to give the floor to one of you now. The question is about going beyond risk reduction when we talk about natural disasters to reinforce resilience in urban areas and to reinforce resilience for the youngsters, perhaps, especially, as you know, this debate has been conceived. So to go further, to go beyond the uh, traditional frame of such discussions and to streamline young people to integrate. So what, how to uh, make the discussion more inclusive when it comes to migration? And that's about mainly about young mi uh, migrating people. Uh, dear Minister, perhaps will you be willing to give it the first shot. That's COP, that's life, that's the COP's reality. Yes, it's quite noisy. Uh, we and our ears are going to be tired, but that's what COPs are about. Thanks, many thanks for the invitation and for raising this topic. It is indeed a very important one. It's extremely important for the populations. Uh, for the my, for the nomads, but not only. So it's uh, it's thus a pleasure for me to take part in this panel uh, upon our city's resilience in an era of migration and climate change. Sorry for the noise. I'm, uh, yes, we we try to remain open. We have the Pacific Islands expressing themselves. Yes, quite close. It's never been that close. So um, the acclimatization uh, to um, climate well, is becoming, becoming quite difficult for everyone. I think it would be better for everyone to use the headsets. Et là, ça va mieux. M'entendez? Okay. Any better now? Can you hear me? Excellent idea. Wonderful. So the adaptation for uh, for increased uh, adaptation has become became has become uh, the crucial objective today, aimed at by all the uh, initiatives, national and uh, international, because there are emergencies uh, in front of these uh, climatic emergencies. 
it is uh, estimated then in, in, in the coming decades uh, two thirds of the world population will live in the cities which will be mostly the case of Africa and Asia the cities uh, that contribute uh, to a greater extent to uh, to GHG today will be inhabited by uh, the, these populations and of course they will suffer from the uh, from the impact of the climatic change uh, like flood of course but also uh, increased temperature and uh, sea level rise so it is obvious today and uh, urgent to integrate the notion of resilience to climatic change in the planning of uh, urban development in Mauritania our approach is uh, of course uh, inclu inclusive and it's, it is to it's taken in uh, consideration uh, this, the, this urban development it's also uh, it, it's a part of also of the um, politics of the government we've translated into our uh, SCAP uh, global strategy and also in sectorial uh, strategies of the different concerned departments uh, amongst other those uh, concerning the environment so we've uh, included uh, this in the C and, uh, CDN uh, okay we'll have the same problems with the uh, arrival of rural populations that uh, move in uh, spontaneously in our cities and we observe more and more uh, a spread anarchic spread of people which of course uh, makes uh, impacts the uh, available resources and the uh, stability of the soils so the recommend started to get interested by, uh, by the use of uh, using new technologies like uh, sustainable constructions but the results are uh, promising and we hope to create interest for these technologies and to do, and to copy them at a greater scale this is how we've uh, built uh, 50 uh, houses in the region of Klimaha, uh, made in uh, uh, Terracotta, uh, that concern uh, uh, that will also concern people from as east, from the east, where the concentration of, of uh, the population is big. We also working on a charter of eco construction, which will uh, engage the the promoters and uh, the builders. Sorry, to build. Uh, biosourced uh, materials like TIFA, it's a, it's a plant that, that is widely uh, spread in, uh, in our regions, also the PAI. This orientation will help us to adopt uh, the uh, energy efficiency in our uh, housing, but also to reinforce the resilience of our uh, residents. It will also allow to develop vertical competences to, an to answer to the growing need of uh, competences in these new uh, specialties. So our politics uh, supports the youth, uh, young entrepreneurs. entrepreneurs. Uh, we want them uh, to work in, in different conditions and to develop themselves. We also want uh, to keep them uh, uh, where they uh, build in their, the place of their boat, uh, birth instead of moving to the cities. Uh, that, that includes uh, many institutions and private uh, firms in, uh, in our country so they to develop these new uh, methods. We have also the question of energy we, that we try to integrate in the, uh, in the new practices to integrate in eco building not only new materials but also energies that will allow uh, to our, our rural zone, zones to be ele uh, to have gain electricity much you know wider space scale okay same so thing in the cities the small and uh, medium cities they are uh, turning platform for uh, rural communities and uh, they, they will stop or slow down the migrations to the big centers. We want to ensure uh, a decent framework of, live, of living in these uh, small and uh, medium cities to, uh, to avoid the uh, overpopulations in great cities and in the capital, obviously. 
and the regional capitals. All that to tell you that the politic of our uh, gun, uh, uh, country is to integrate the urbanization plan, uh, plans. It's not only uh, a question that belongs to the, the, the Ministry of uh, Habitat, but also the one of uh, environment to integrate these new tactics. We, we support uh, Abidem, we would, we would talk during the second panel, and then new startups that develop not only new materials, but also the use of plastic uh, in, uh, in, in tiling. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Spencer. Thank you for this very interesting presentation of the politics. Uh, well, I would say the, uh, the general approach of your government and when it comes to in, uh, inclu inclusion, uh, technical uh, solutions, innovation, but with an objective that, that uh, consists in uh, retaining uh, populations on their grounds to slow down the migration, the flows, and to develop this uh, filtering through secondary smaller towns, which is uh, well, it's very important what you've said by the end that uh, several uh, ministries work together. We are uh, in what is called the whole to government approach as uh, it concerns, in the case of Mauritania, uh, uh, two ministry, probably others. Now the question is, could we, could we hear now the voice of, of uh, local government? I would propose to listen to uh, on video a recording of the Freetown mayor, the lady I've met s uh, several times, she's extremely interesting also. Oh là là. Nous avons un problème de son. We're dealing with an issue. We can't hear the mayor, we can't hear the the video oh better platform to continue to highlight the intersection between climate change and migration this has been an opportunity like every other for me and others in c40 and mmc to continue to ring the bell and amplify our message that with increasing temperatures and continued extreme events. We know that there will be inevitably more migration, which is climate change induced. And it's important that we have solutions to that migration to make people more resilient where they are and so that where they go, they're made less vulnerable. For this adaptation, we require finance. And that has been my simple message at COP. Alors, voilà un message. Well, that's a simple message and a strong one indeed. Uh, we are leading, heading towards more migration and more migration, to, more migration towards cities, big cities. Uh, there are no shortcuts. We can't avoid that. Uh, beyond from the helping people uh, moving, beyond uh, the helping those who help migrating. Uh, people with new with new uh, jobs, new cultures, new ways of life. Apart from adaptation, there is resilience and resilience for all, if I may say. Uh, all right, perhaps shall we hear the vo a voice from the research world, Miss Miriam Merad, uh, Director of Research Professor at the National Center of Scientific Research in France. Can you hear me? All right. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm uh, extremely happy to take part, to be taking part in this round table that gathers decision makers, but also uh, researchers and various uh, stakeholders from Europe, from Africa, and from various regions. I'd like to share a couple of points and among inside our 
small group raise two questions, two topics, two challenges for us, decision makers and citizens, but also for us as scientists and researchers. So the first thing I would like to tackle upon resilience. You might know that the word resilience implies some biases. As, as soon as you, ta you talk about resilience, you're invited to, 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 to think about resili being resilient to something, to some event, to something one can observe. So, uh, and it's about who is going to be resilient, because it depends on something, of, on a use, and on somebody. Uh, we've been focusing on the resilience to disasters, what you were calling the, the fast, the fast ones, and that we call in the in, in the risk vocabulary the acute risk, what, which is what we can observe now and quite uh, acutely, painfully. Resilience for whom? Who is supposed to be resilient? As soon as we talk about resilience, a city's resilience, some individuals' resilience, organizations' resilience, the question is who's starting, from where from, and in what direction? And you, of course, you can get several answers, several uh, points of view, several sensibilities, sensitivities, vulnerabilities, and uh, vulnerabilities, and forecasts. That kind of resilience that we are trying to uh, to process together is what we call a reactive resilience, which is about managing negative trends or phenomena that are observable, that, that you do observe. The, the ones we are talking about are gaining uh, momentum and, uh, and volume, unfortunately. Uh, we've always, we've all, we are all in on the same boat, yeah? uh, obviously. And climate change shows other kinds of events that you call the slow ones. In the uh, risk nomenclature terminology, we call, the, we call them chronical, um, chronic risks. Small doses, but very rare. We feel it, we see it, we've been there, we've been through it in the past. And there is what we call a diffuse risk, when you know that sooner or later, some events and phenomena can combine their forces so that they gain even more negative effects on our health or on our environment without you knowing about the final consequences and implications. These new challenges invite us to ask the question uh, around resilience. Resilience to what? Since we can't understand fully what it means, of course it raises other challenges, and resilience for whom? So the question is how to co-build, how to build together this notion. Together we have to talk about resilience, but the, the resilience is about uh, talking about the way we can act together. It's about being engaged, not only around negatives, which we call the direct risk, because it's limited. We have to talk about our capacity, our ability, ability to be risking, to take, uh, to, to take chances. And that's what we call the reactive resilience. The action comes to you. It's not you going to the action, it's action coming to you. Beyond that, uh, and you've, uh, you've uh, mentioned, uh, dear Minister, you've emphasized it, this re resilience is, doesn't, does not depend merely upon our ability to react, but upon the legitimacy, the legitimacy of this action. We have the occasion now to gather some communities, to, uh, to gather researchers, citizens, and to create a resilience culture. This resilience culture, as we're going to see during the next panel, depends upon the sensitivity, the trainings, the level of knowledge, the culture that we gather and engage to create power to act, power to work, power to fight. We don't exist without the ability to fight together. Um, our ambassador raised our attention uh, drew our attention upon the, the amount of challenges, the, the question of the efficiency of the actions we intend and we carry out together to make things better. And this challenge asks the questions 
question about the new forms of evaluation of the pol of public policies that have contributed in the, the last years to make things better. So it's about how to change the world for the best via public policies. We deal with systemic challenges in our countries in order to measure those slow killers you were mentioning, those chronic risks and chronic uh, and, and diffuse risks. So the question is about how, as you, uh, as you mentioned, dear Minister, how to carry out some environmental policies that won't be separate from the economic part and from the social aspects. It has to be together, not apart. Uh, this, this is about considering as well these migration flows that we observe together with the global changes and the climate changes. It's not the first time in, in history. It occurred earlier and we have proven able to face them together. The, the, the fact is what we face now when it comes to migration flows is we are all afraid of an acceleration. Not in terms of uh, not, not meaning it's not that about the possibility that it will occur or not, but about the, uh, the scale. So if we were to go back to, to history, uh, we've seen in the past, if we were to, to tackle uh, World War II's history, called the uh, operational research, this discipline, this dis disciplines of operational research, that was deploying a means of help to assist on decisions in order to accompany a better management of the uh, challenges uh, coming forward with the, the world uh, with the war. Now we have a common a common challenges, so we can uh, do uh, some engineering uh, that will uh, help us to uh, get over the vulnerabilities uh, that are the part of life of uh, all the migrants' lives and to act uh, in a way so uh, this uh, migration that hasn't been uh, uh, something similar to the origin, so it becomes a, an opportunity for everyone. I will stop here and I'm sure that we'll have the possibility to, uh, to talk more about these questions. I thank you very much uh, for this very interesting uh, perspective, let's say, uh, this view uh, and for this word about the new challenges and how these new challenges as, uh, that force us to, to see again, to watch again the, the question of uh, the resilience, these openings, the, uh, the cross-cutting of the uh, approach. Uh, okay, uh, well, if you would allow, if the uh, acting would uh, allow, I would be tempted to listen to Mr. Cédric Bouvier in uh, about the presentation of the risks and politics uh, policies that uh, allow uh, to face these challenges. Cédric Boyer, who is the general director of the prevention of risks in the French ministries, Ministry of uh, the uh, Energy Transition, and who is also, well, I think about uh, fires, about the risks, but also uh, sources of stronger constraints. Climate change is having a significant impact on natural risks such as fires, coastal flooding and new dangers emerging in mountainous regions. It is also behind the need for tighter obligations at industrial sites by the weather incidents affecting their installations or pressure from the lack of water resources for cooling operations and other safety functions. In order to adapt, we need to work on a number of areas to better apprehend the dangers and the way in which they evolve with climate change and ensure that everyone is aware of such risks and how to behave in their presence. To take adaptive measures, which means not only taking informed decisions for the future in terms of city planning and organization, but also making existing structures less vulnerable. To anticipate on events by planning crisis management measures, as well as the means for returning to normality as quickly as possible to organize a feedback system and learn from it. To make risk culture and resilience more widespread, we must constantly improve the quality, accessibility and helpfulness of the information provided to the population. It is useful to increase efficiency in reaching target audiences. 
to multiple actions and to mobilize partners, such as employees, employers, teachers, associations, collectivities, as much as to show what has been achieved and offer reassurance about what can be obtained through mobilization. Climate change is indeed a challenge in terms of planning, but it comes alongside many other challenges that planners have already been facing. One of the key issues is of course to integrate risks and vulnerability right from the initial design stages of land planning. This naturally means avoiding certain parts of region and sometimes relocating projects, but it sometimes also means seeking inspiration in evolution choices to reduce vulnerability while holding planning decisions. For instance, we recently organized the amateur call for expression of interest in the aim of guiding regions and reorganisation that are exposed to natural risks. Nine regions were selected and 64 multidisciplinary teams comprising, among others, architects, urban planners and landscapers submitting projects, showing that innovations were possible. Winners were selected at the end of last year and we are now entering the practical phase. So all these good ideas can soon be made available to other regions. Hello. So we've just heard a presentation that is, was very interesting about the proposal, a uh, French one, about management, risk management uh, centered of the uh, adaptation and political management, but also uh, more technique, technical uh, management of risks. It would be extremely interesting to hear the, the World Bank and to hear the, uh, the financial dimension of this uh, risk management, so I would uh, ask um, Mr. Uh, Simo and Mewi, uh, Director for uh, the Central and Oriental Africa, to, uh, to, to tell him, us his uh, version of the things. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank you for uh, this invitation to this very important panel. I'm happy to share with you the works the results of our research uh, within our bank, especially what was had been recently uh, when it comes to concrete actions uh, with the, uh, well, in the context of the, uh, the discussion we've had today. Uh, the migration, the climatic migration and the resilience of cities uh, are uh, very uh, connected subjects, I would say. Uh, our recent report Grand, uh, West Africa Grantswell uh, says that if no action, no concrete action, uh, would, it was not engaged uh, about the climate and the development, 32, even 32 million of people in West Africa uh, would be uh, forced to migrate inside of their own countries. And this is by 2050. It's, it's awful, it's scary. Lots of capitals and uh, big cities of West Africa, uh, who are uh, a big part of the um, of the national revenue, are, are located on the coast. Uh, over the um, climatic risks, they still develop, and they offer uh, possibilities, economic possibilities, from migrants who come from uh, port regions. However, uh, their exposition and the vulnerability uh, to the climatic um, risk will, uh, will increase the probability of a secondary migration in the opposite direction, which will uh, make their future uncertain if, not, if we do nothing to remediate it. If the migrations, climatic migration schemes are not mastered, not only they will... They, they will lead to, uh, they will uh, help, they will put in question the progress uh, accomplished in terms of development in the cities and the centers of growth. In the context of uh, climate change, it is possible to make the cities ecologically viable, resilient, and uh, as said before, uh, like in Maurit Mauritania. I would like to uh, draw your attention on the launch on, of the fair report of our of the bank uh, world uh, on the 17th uh, of November in the World Bank uh, 
pavilion. It will be presented there and we'll propose a, a framework from today's discussion. The cities from the, from the countries with a low income are the most affected by the climatic shock. And there, this impact uh, stimulates and becomes like a chain. We found, for example, uh, indexes that show clearly that the shocks connected with the droughts outside the cities uh, uh, cause bigger urbanizations, especially in the zone of the Sahel. This growth of the urbanization is mostly uh, informal and non-planned, which uh, causes an extra pressure on the quality of serv basic services, the resources and the uh, jobs employment. We have to act now to avoid the future trap and to create a more sustainable trajectory. It is essential to free the potential of young migrants so they can contribute to the climatic actions and to the building of resilient cities. That in order to uh, to, uh, to, um, to tackle the, the new challenges, there are solutions to which uh, young youth can contribute. Let me give you two examples. First of all, the solutions based on nature is one, uh, one of the approaches to help the cities to protect themselves against uh, the, uh, the, the, the catastrophic effects of climate change, plus extra uh, ben benefits like uh, maintaining the bios biodiversity, and it builds, allows also to engage young people. The, the urban parks and the zones of retention allow to refresh and to retain water uh, while uh, maintaining the biodiversity and to, uh, to create public spaces for the community. The uh, residents and local associations, uh, including youth, are implied in the uh, creation of these spaces, the building of these spaces also, their maintenance and their use. The initiative of uh, AD uh, of, uh, of, uh, to which uh, the World Bank participates in, in countries like the Cameroon and, the, and Mali uh, emphasize the, the participation of the residents, especially of the young, of youth, of young people in the uh, uh, organization of, of public spaces in their cities. Second example now, the exploitation of uh, digital economy in the uh, climatic action. In Africa, the young people play a crucial role in the development of uh, creation of numeric of digital tools for the development of resilient city. We have uh, noticed the enthusiasm uh, of young people for the, these uh, initiatives. For example, in Tanzania, in South Africa, and in Mali, young people from uh, these uh, non-formal boroughs participate in campaigns of uh, uh, spreading uh, information about things like uh, floods or uh, the heat. This contributes not only to, uh, to, to tackle uh, the main uh, mm, mm, problems in the cities, but also to reinforce the old competences to be better prepared, prepared to integrate the labor market. This uh, engagement should uh, should take place not only in big cities, but also in the secondary cities, who rule a crucial role uh, by connecting the, uh, the, the rural zones with the cities and offering new opportunities to, to youngsters. This is why the, 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 bank, the World Bank uh, finances a big program for uh, secondary cities in the uh, Ivory Coast and in Ghana that may emphasize uh, the economic local development and the resilience of the cities. Finally, uh, uh, good planification, planning, sorry, uh, uh, and, these, uh, and the actions in the cities will uh, allow to not only to avoid the worst uh, impacts of the migrations, but also to uh, to use the uh, the augment the increase of the youth population in future years. For the exploitation in the framework of the uh, of an economic growth and, uh, and ecological tradition, widely speaking. <coughs> Thank you very much for your attention. 
Merci, Monsieur le Directeur. Thank you, uh, Director, uh, and thank you for reminding reminding us about the figures, dramatic figures for, for the whole world, but especially when it comes to Western Africa with those 32 potentially displaced persons from now to 2050, should no step be taken, should no measure be, t be taken. So, and it's about the basic services, but about, about the a country's development, when it comes to a development forecast, the 2030, agenda and uh, and the way to get there thank you for for these openings and these potential solutions if i if uh, you, you were talking about freeing the youngsters energy we have two youngsters here uh rose or are you a first comment please before we switch to the next panel. It would be great to hear your voices and your reactions when it comes to what has been said for, for now. Uh, who will be willing to take the floor? Uh, Rose, perhaps, or Luc Mont? About the sea, about the governmental, about what has been said by one of our speakers might be about finances as well. Rose Kabusinge, she's a climate change activist from Yongo's Climate and Migration Working Group. An activist, he, she's a, well, she's a member, a member of this organization. It's, uh, they belong to the Secretary General of the United Nations. They prepare the COP each year, but she's also, uh, she's created, she's funded uh, a, a workforce upon climate and migration. She's its chairwoman. She's leading the work of the, youngster, of the youngsters when it comes to the uh, constituency of the younger. The floor is yours. Thank you so much uh, for this platform. I think one thing I've learned already is I need to learn French. <laughs> yes. Uh, They've already introduced me, and my name is Rose Kopsing, and I'm from Uganda. And uh, hmm, yeah, I'm part of Yango, which is the official youth constituency of uh, the official youth and children constituency of UNFCCC. And uh, last year, I initiated the migration working group, uh, re recognizing that the topic on climate mobility was missing. Because uh, last year, I attended my first COP and I didn't hear anything. I remember I reached out to uh, Madam Caroline. I was like, we need to do something. And she's like, yes, uh, you have my support. And <laughs> really appreciate uh, the support that Thank IOM you. has provided uh, to me and other young people in the working group. For example, 12 of us from the Eastern Horn of Africa were able to attend the Kampala Ministerial mm -hmm. Conference. And we provided our voices that were integrated in the Kampala Declaration on migration, climate change, and environment. And now we've worked on uh, the African Youth Declaration for Climate Mobility, and we launched it yesterday. So uh, reflecting on the voices that have come uh, from the, this, this panel, and I think it's quite motivating for us, the youth, to hear that, because one of the demands in this document is that we demand human mobility, especially planned relocation, safe, regular migration are recognized as adaptation options. Starting with this COP, more so seeing it on the agenda in COP28 and going forward with strategies to harness uh, human mobility. So coming in this room, I feel like this, we already converted, like we all here recognize that people have migrated lot from centuries and centuries, escaping from suffering escaping for confli from conflicts and escaping from disasters. Why is it so hard for the leaders to recognize it? Why is it such a very sensitive topic? So, uh, so I really appreciate the conversation and also hearing, seeing this collaboration from the World Bank, from uh, local governments, uh, from you know, research. Uh, I, I heard how you were critiquing uh, the word resilience. And I think it's a great, it's a great uh, kind of collaboration, and that is what we are calling for. 
as young people. Uh, so we, in this document, we called out for collaboration, especially in country collaboration, because most of the people that are being displaced by floods and droughts, the slow or rapid onset usually remain internally displaced. So we need the in-country collaborations to build community cohesion. For example, in Uganda, we've, we've ha we have uh, the Karamoja subregion where people have been starving to death, like starving to death. And uh, this year, a number of them, I can't quote the figure that is available on newspaper Daily Monitor says 900 people this year have died due to starvation. Uh, but, uh, and then, but when you look at those people, most of, most of the young people are walking all the way, so many kilometers, over 400, to find themselves in Kampala uh, on the streets. For you who have been in Kampala, and those ones who have not, please come to Uganda. But uh, for those ones who have been, if you've seen most of the kids on the streets and the, and the girls are from that region. And, uh, so, and I also realized like, it's very important to prepare communities to receive moving, uh, to receive uh, the, com uh, the people on the move. And I felt like that was kind of like a gap. Uh, but also the uh, international collaborations are very, are very important uh, where we need both the private sector, the public sector, the communities, the cross-border collaborations uh, to allow uh, young people and other vulnerable people on the move to be able to move, not, not to be immobile once they, uh, yes, when they are stuck, when they are being displaced. But also importantly is addressing the root causes of vulnerability. I'll say that, uh, I think I've said this statement before, and researchers say it and other activists, that there's not such a thing as a natural disaster. It all goes back to inequalities, underserved communities, poverty, that are all interconnected with historical injustices, colonialism, extractive uh, systems. So if we don't address those issues, look at a flood. When a flood happens, I'll give you an example. In Uganda, the recent flood we had in Imbal in the eastern part of the country, it's usually the poor that cannot afford to, have to, to buy safe uh, land that is on good landscape, on, on, on good, uh, so the poor can only afford to buy land in the wetland, in the floodplain, and when it floods, they're the ones that are affected. But if there were no peop poor people living in the floodplains, then it wouldn't be a disaster. So, yeah. uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, I really appreciate the conversation and uh, the presentation, the video that came through that talked about the funds, uh, I think as the young people, we, one of the demands we had was the African Youth Fund on Climate Mobility. And we had a breakthrough yesterday with the Bosch Foundation. I can see we have a Bosch uh, translation. So the Bosch Foundation committed 100,000 euros to support the implementation of the demands we have here. So I don't know if I should stop here, because yes, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Royce, for these first words and recognizing, <laughs> yes, that things are at last moving a little bit, um, but, but still uh, the, the really dramatic challenges that uh, you recalled in Uganda or other uh, countries of Africa. I would like now to propose, um, to propose you all to enter the second panel, which is going from the what, if I can say, to the how. W where, pardon, je me suis mise à parler en anglais, j'ai tellement l'habitude. I started talking English. Sorry, I'm quite used to we're talking English. I started talking English as well. Uh, so we are talking about what. Now let's talk about how. What are what the solutions are, the innovative solutions in order to reinforce the population's resilience in order to mitigate the risk. We have several of several speakers as well, uh, interesting ones, of course. Uh, Mr. Bernard Gezo, who is sitting somewhere here, I believe. Thank you. Thank you once again, dear Minister. It's an honor, Dr. Professor Miss Mer Merad Rose. Thank you. Thank you. I will come back to you. Bonjour, Monsieur. Monsieur Gezo, alors, nous avons. We have uh, several persons online. We have here, maybe in our room, Mr. Umar Wele. from 
right, Tanya. Thank you very much. And we have also our two youngsters who are here, Lukman Akintola and Rose again. And we'll have several uh, participants online. So I would like to welcome for this panel Mr. Bernard Gezo, who's an uh, international expert in vulnerability and uh, resilience of the territories, who represents the uh, French agency AFPCNT. Mr. Uber Willet, who is the director uh, of habitat and development in of the Habitat uh, Agency in Mauritania, and Lukman Akintola, who's joining us, uh, who just was joined us, who's responsible for the platform for the migration and the youth and the children uh, within an initiative called ACMI, African Cli uh, Climate Mobility Initiative, a new initiative uh, who's been, who's existed for, for two years, I mean the initiative, not the person, and who's working on this uh, cross uh, aspects of uh, migration and climate and across Rosinbouge, uh, uh, Rosa. Uh, online, we'll have uh, Ellen Sabatia Connor, who's responsible for the Africa zone, Sub-Saharan uh, zone in the ADEM, uh, French uh, agency for, for uh, development. Also, Mr. Xavier Angel, who's engineer in geosciences and environment, who represents the, the who represents the, my, the, man, the Ministry of Environment and, and Sustainable Development of Ivory Coast. I think this is everything. That's a lot. You'll agree. Um, maybe, Mr. Geza, would you like to tell us what are the, the solutions, the, the vision of, the, of your agency, but also the solutions that you recommend uh, in the situation that just has, has been described? Yes, welcome everyone. I am uh, very happy to participate to this uh, discussion with you. My subject is building and building, rebuilding better. It's about resilient cities. And I will uh, ask the question, what, what is the place of the, these youngsters in the resilient cities? And I will repeat what uh, Dr. Mr. Simon said, and we said on the energy of youngsters and this uh, energy we don't doubt there is but how to free this uh, energy that's what he asked by building a resilient city we could you may uh, see the first uh, slide about this nation of building or rebuilding better this notion coming from the Sendai framework uh, of the United Nations you know that we have an international level uh, director uh, scheme of uh, protection against the catastrophes, the disasters. So this is a framework that uh, made by the United Nations that is updated every 10 years. And uh, the last one is from 2015, so as you can see, it's five years old, more than some years old. Uh, but what is interesting, there are some of the recommendations to concern the risk management, but there is the priority number four. It's another register because it's about uh, to, uh, improving the preparation of how to do and build, rebuild better. What does it mean? It's to uh, engage the resilience uh, at the service of uh, the um, durability, sustainability in the context of the um, urban uh, growth uh, in, the, in the world, the general urbanization and the context uh, that is a uh, that worries us today. I'm talking about the climate change. What is what means to to build and to rebuild better? It's about implementing uh, a new diamond, dynamics of transformation of cities because we need dynamics. We need youth, youngsters, and energy. So you see the link directly, right? These dynamics have to be collective, collective. You know, in order to work, it must be uh, intergenerational. To, to deploy in time, and it must be learned through learning to take into consideration the complexity of the situations we need to treat, to tackle. Uh, there are uh, certain mandatory stages. The first one that you can see on uh, of the stage, it's uh, uh, it's uh, raising awareness of the to the culture of risk. I'm talking about young people. Why? Because youngsters are exposed. 
uh, to uh, to the effects of uh, affected by climate change. They may, will face crisis, so we can talk about with them about this and uh, to understand what that means for them and to work on the on the on the aspect. Secondly, uh, the youngsters are curious; they are open to uh, to the new. They want to learn. So we can make them work also on uh, the, the, the the city of tomorrow. What is the resilient city for children? How do you imagine the future town, the city, uh, with these climate changes? So on this basis, we'll be able to work with them, including uh, uh, these very young. Personally, I remember when I when I was a kid, they made me work on a of the city of the of the year 2000. That was a great city subject uh, when I was young. What will be the city of the, the, the year 2000? Now we could work uh, on the subject like what will be the city of 2050 in the context of climatic change? So the uh, second thing, uh, the students, they are still young. The students as future professionals, they have to train to, uh, to, to reflect the different, in a different way than the previous generations. They have to think in a different way uh, about the old, el older people. And in the framework of the studies, they should do uh, apprentice, apprentice, apprenticeships about the uh, climate change. Of course, differently than uh, the youngsters of, the, of five, ten years old. Here we have an example here on the right side. Uh, these are students who go on the ground to learn about the vulnerability uh, and the capacity of resilience of the uh, in residents. Another example for the students. Here you can see the future engineers of the uh, National uh, School of uh, Public Works. And this school uh, has this thing that uh, it holds lots of uh, foreign students. So we have a mixing of cultures within the school. And uh, what will they uh, do, these future engineers? They will have to find constructive techniques that would be different from the ones that all the, uh, the previous generations was, uh, were using. So they are not going to only to learn uh, the techniques that will be transferred by uh, the uh, professionals of older age. They will have to innovate and uh, find new solutions. As we can see on this slide, uh, the master department the master green building, uh, green building in, uh, of this school, the students learn to, 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 to take uh, in account the changes. That it's not only about techniques, we think about strategies of uh, which will tomorrow will be uh, different than what we know today. We see on the screen that in their school they uh, they thinking about uh, uh, solutions based on nature. And not only to make it uh, beautiful, uh, it's because there are energy problems to to be tackled, and we need new techniques to to do it. Uh, forgive me. Can I uh, ask you either to uh, to conclude shortly? because I have five, uh, five speakers. Yeah, thank you for telling me, actually. Yes, this slide, uh, very quickly. These are today's professionals who also have to change their practices. Of course, uh, uh, not only young people, youngsters, uh, these today's engineers, we, we need to do that, like the example of Serena, uh, that, that does really Creating areas so that we better master the uh, spreading of this plant uh, the the other slide before before that yes so that's a plant we can quite easily collect we can gather we can uh, pick it up store capture and store as you see on the pictures you see how it looks like as we cut it as we dry it we you see how it, what it looks like there are many holes in it. It has certain qualities, significant qualities for the uh, for the uh, sectors we were taking into, we were considering. Uh, lots of work to to better know the plant and its dynamics. 
we've conducted research, some, some research in order to discover the best way to cut it, the best way to store it, the best way to use it. Lots of work in order to get it better prepared when it comes to uh, gathering techniques, logistics, to its upcycling in a certain way, because it used to be considered rubbish, it used to be considered a waste, a problem, and we make an asset out of it. All right, so um, you see now the uh, work we are make when it comes to burning it. It's, uh, it's craft, it's craft activities, it has been implemented in Senegal, in uh, Ronk, in Senegal, and in Mauritania as well. We have economic groups of women, craft units in uh, in Mauritania, in Rosso, 2022, and the installations. It's a testing phase, but the results are, are quite uh, are quite promising. It's looking good. It's just the beginning, but we 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 hope it will bring mass uh, mass results. That's before carbonization. It's uh, you have clay there, you have rice, and you can burn it have gum, Arabic gum, you can sell it. And it's the interesting thing when it comes to producing this, um, this fuel is that you use local biomass, which constitutes uh, an alternative to deforestation. Next slide, please. Now, as a building, raw material uh, because the building sector especially in tropical areas in, Af in Africa is seldomly adapted to the climate conditions the models that are used are based upon the reality in uh, in Europe for instance you have you have uh, you have to come up with other materials it's a kind of um, of green concrete it's something completely different as you see, we are using new kinds of raw materials. It's biosourced, it's organic sourced, as long as you use typha. We've been working for, for a couple of years now on several possibilities. We use either the, only the typha, we have compressed typha, we, can, uh, we have uh, various forms, we have uh, typha straw, the, uh, mixes with clay, we have panels, uh, we have um, typha oils as well. Uh, and so it's quite advanced when it comes to the various, it comes in different uh, colors and shapes really. Uh, you, you might encounter that kind of usage in Senegal for instance. And new materials that are being developed now like concrete made of Typha. So we've validated the interests. We've proven that this material, this raw material, is interesting and might prove uh, a bit of handy in the construction area. So it's about using material, raw materials made of typha with bioclimate techniques. Thanks to that dynamic, we, we obtain better adapted uh, buildings and reduce the carbon impacts of uh, of the building industry because building out of concrete traditional concrete has a huge uh, environmental impact you can see a couple of pics here uh, trainings uh, trainees as you can see bottom right because we we teach how to build how to use that kind of materials while when building houses is very Important. So we we, we actually train bricklayers, we train engineers, we train we train architects, engaging many youngsters, among which among whom we see many women, which is something we highly value as well. Okay, uh, is it is that, is that your last slide? Yes, it is. Uh, the next slide, at least. Uh, a couple of uh, uh, you see the Pearl House. Uh, it's a traditional Pearl House. You know the Pearl, the Pearl uh, tribe, the Pearl people. They have their own um, architect, architecture traditions. So it's nothing new under the sun, really. 
um, from in Senegal, you have pearl houses that are made out, made of taifa. It's something real, something they know and they have known for centuries. They use this plant in order to build to build walls as well, um, uh, fortifications, even so that something. It's just about enhancing something that has been made, that has been done. There's no competition between what we do and what their traditions is, uh, their traditions are about. Um, I have a couple of examples with straw taifa roofs. It's in Senegal, in Rao, uh, La Ferme Pédagogique. Many trainings have been implemented with many craftsmen that are very extremely competent and create that kind of roofs in Senegal. Uh, there is an agro-industrial unit in Senegal as, as well it is in uh, Zingisho. A private villa in Mauritania, uh, we can tackle upon, the, upon this later. Uh, the taifa has been used as well while building this private villa. There are, there are panels. We have a health center. Some are built from scratch, ex nihilo. Some are renovated using taifa. We have an, egg, an eco uh, quarter, an eco neighborhood in uh, its, ban, its name Ban Ban. It's in the city of Thiès in Senegal. Um, yet another project. These uh, constructions have not been uh, financed by Tikao directly, but Tikao brings has brought its uh, expertise when it comes to climate issues when it comes to the knowledge, the techniques, when it comes to Taifa. So the Eco Neighborhood is a project that is financed by the ADEM in, uh, in Senegal, with lots of Taifa usage as well when it comes to the blocks, to the bricks, uh, to the uh, insula insulation of the building. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, do I have to, to, to conclude? Yes, yes, to, to say the least, yeah. But the important thing, uh, uh, I, I, when it comes to what I've been, I would like to, to wrap things up a bit. Taifa has been considered as a problem, now it's, it's considered an asset. So, as I was putting it, it's a kind of a cycling. We are making something valuable, something precious, or s out of something that was considered waste, rubbish. To go beyond that, to go further, lots of consultation has to be made, dissemination, advocacy in the upcoming weeks and months. We've been working a lot but when it comes to the, to, to the future. That's a program that is, that is led by various stakeholders. If you could show, we are working with, um, with the government of Mauritania, that, whom I would like to thank. Uh, I would like to, many thanks to Senegal, to Marit Mauritania, to, to France, to all the partners that make uh, this project a reality. Uh, from the notion, from the design uh, to the to the implementation, you have the, uh, th many thanks, many thanks once again. But but uh, it's hugely interesting, very instructive. Uh, I understand what you've be. I see what you've done, and I understand what you're saying. But we still have to stick to uh, to, to, to to the time frame. Uh, but you, you can always uh, you feel free to send via email uh, as attached files via just any any way to the other speakers or the audience. Don't feel free to, to send people as well. We'll be in touch. Do not worry. I have to take, to give the floor to other speakers who are sitting here physically with us on stage and. Perhaps via Patrick Offray, uh, feel free to drop your number and email to Patrick Offray. Uh, send your presentation as well, uh, because it is. But Omar Veren is with us, who will be uh, picking on this uh, issue. He's the Abidem uh, director. He's from Mauritania, obviously, and he's got the floor. Hello. Oui. Merci. Uh... Thank you. not get back on the Tikao tool, I will talk about Mauritania. I will uh, mention the uh, engagement of uh, the young generations or the residents of the, and the, 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 the implication of uh, Abidem in the system. So I get back to, uh, to Abidem, it's a, it's a, a SME in, from Mauritania, 
created by a young migrant at the time who, uh, who's lived in France, who's uh, been through migration. Came back to Mauritania to exchange and to share the experiences that he's acquired during his uh, migration period. So watch more and more in, uh, in uh, eco, -constru eco construction. So I will tell you how the innovation of young migrants through the valorization of the TVAC may contribute to the capacity of uh, resilience of our communities and cities. Next slide. The TIFA, uh, quickly, in, uh, in terms of uh, 80,000 hectares uh, of arable uh, uh, ground. It's in the region, Traza region. On the other hand, as a problem, uh, problem we have is access to, uh, to uh, urban habitat in our cities. Comfortable habitat and decent habitat. More and more uh, do we have the floods that we've said before that uh, emphasize the vulnerability of our populations. How does the, uh, how, uh, how, does, how TIFA participate in the real of our cities? Uh, the approach is simple. I uh, was inspired by the uh, experience uh, that I've acquired during uh, trainings in Europe. Well, this is I'm trying to uh, to bring uh, some changes, the improvement of the quality of our uh, living uh, framework by the use of TIFA as a construction material. So on the other side, it's also uh, the, mm, the, the, the creation of carbon wells as you know, there's more or more the use of uh, the, the, the sequester, the pollution. We can s see a small island of heat in the, uh, in the cities uh, on the big uh, cross um, roads where there's big, big pollution. So uh, through this uh, approach, we work a lot. I would like to thank you very much to one of my partners the University of the Yorkshire. Uh, we've, um, we've been sp speaking a lot uh, even in this approach. On this basis, we work a lot with the young migrants uh, uh, who uh, are in France who had come back. Uh, it would be nice if the speaker could hold the microphone closer to his mouth. I'm sorry to bring a solution in for this resilience. And also, we exchange a lot, we transfer a lot of competences and technologies. Abidem works, uh, shares with the French company, Acta, uh, who is in, uh, specialized in uh, biosource materials. And next year, we go into ex uh, to exchange uh, young people, my employees, who will go to France uh, in groups of three for training, for employee and initiation, and they will come back to come to work in Mauritania. It's about come, about uh, mm, about working with the youngsters and to use them to prepare the, for this future uh, development. So today, we may say that we are ready. After four, five years of research with our partners, we've. Uh, created a new product, uh, a habitat, low-carbon habitat. We've just started uh, a prototype in our Tabaraza. Uh, Usually in January, we will organize a day for biosphere's habitat with our different partners, uh, academic and, uh, and public powers. And I would like to, to thank the, the the Ministry of, uh, well, the, the public authorities um, of Mauritania, they've helped us a lot. They facilitated, they facilitated our, uh, by implementing the charter of uh, construction uh, and secondly by creating, by pushing for a creation uh, of a trading system to allow to accompany the youngster, uh, whether from here or from there, to participate to this uh, resilience of cities. And I will uh, finish the, the last uh, part. No, now I come back to. Uh... Okay, for me, 
the migrant, the, the young migrant. Uh, he, he always brings his own innovation and projects. The migrant is also an actor of cooperation because he, this, he, he travels, he goes, he comes back, so he learns. And a migrant is also a potential entrepreneur who's able to change, to push. And I'll get back to the example, personal example. At the beginning, when I started the eco-construction uh, for the materials in Mauritania, when I came back from France, uh, people were looking at me in a strange way, but uh, today I would like to, to thank the ministry to allow me to come and to share. This is something that is possible to exchange, to change the vision that we have of a, of a young migrant. And in Europe, we have frameworks that have been uh, implemented, like Erasmus, that allow uh, the, young, the youngsters to uh, to move also outside, outside Europe. Why not on the other side uh, uh, of the continent? Young people always want to go and search for new things. And the last, uh, uh, it's a it's a call for me today. We will have to work in a way so in. Uh, public, uh, public institutions turn in the direction of the valorization of young mig migrants. Uh, cooperation to the centralized is an accelerator of the sustainable development. Okay, I will stop here. Many thanks and congratulations for this, uh, this long path um, migrants becoming entrepreneurs. Thank you for that approach. Uh, congratulations. Yes, that um, integrates it's, it's streamlining youngsters and young migrating people and the way they contribute to creating jobs in your country. I think just as Miss Sabatier said and yourself, I think many thanks should go to the hands of uh, the Ministry and of Environment. Thank you for co-leading these innovative projects for Mauritania but for Senegal as well. Uh, before um, going from Mauritania south, uh, we were about to hear somebody from uh, Ivory Coast. He's connected with us. Uh, he's in charge of implementing the environmental information system in Ivory Coast via different public and private uh, initiatives, Mr. Xavier Aonjo, Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development, Ivory Coast. Can you hear me? Xavier Aonjo from the Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development, Ivory Coast, engineer specialized in geosciences and environment in charge of environmental promotion and advocacy inside the ministry dealing very much with public private uh, corporations initiatives the floor is yours but we can't hear you as for now Uh, I guess your microphone is muted. I'm afraid that's. I'm afraid. I, I think it's a, that's the only reason, which would be good news, in fact, because I see a red icon. If you see your microphone, your microphone icon, it's red. We cannot hear you, unfortunately. You're muted, you're still muted. Something you can see. Yes, is it better now? Yes, we can hear you, at least. Many thanks, and sorry about the technical issues. Here in Ivory Coast, I am indeed in charge uh, of, uh, well, I, um, I'm work on a project that has been initiated by our government. It's supported by the French government as well here in Ivory Coast. Uh, you probably know that the Ivory Coast is a country that welcomes many migrants. 
short announcement from the booth. Uh, it's 6 p.m. Uh, our duty is over as for today. Many thanks and see you tomorrow. Activity, plus particularly l'agriculture. Vous savez que la Côte d'Ivoire, depuis son indépendance, compte son économie sur l'agriculture. Alors, l'agriculture, aujourd'hui, est de plus en plus impactée donc, par le changement climatique. Un des secteurs de l'agriculture qui, qui, qui est de loin pas non moins important, c'est l'agriculture urbaine et périurbaine, qui a déjà montré son importance en matière de, de résilience des villes de l'Afrique de l'Ouest. Mais cette agriculture est en voie aujourd'hui de disparition à cause de fortes urbanisations euh, des villes, avec ce développement d'infrastructures diverses. C'est dans ce cadre-là que l'OIM, à travers son projet MITSA, veut valoriser le travail des migrants dans ce secteur agricole, tout en associant la protection de l'environnement en Côte d'Ivoire. De manière concrète, le projet MITSA, ici euh, en Côte d'Ivoire, consiste à quoi Dans un premier temps, il a été question dans le district d'Abidjan, d'identifier les zones favorables à, à la pratique de cette agriculture, c'est-à-dire l'agriculture urbaine et périurbaine. Il s'agit de regarder les endroits autour de la grande ville d'Abidjan, ici d'Abidjan, quelles sont les zones à forte activité agricole et où les, 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 les zones sont vulnérables, c'est-à-dire les espaces, les terres sont exposés à l'inondation euh, où on peut capter des eaux pluviales pour éviter la dégradation des sols, hein, telles que l'érosion, et voir la concentration de euh, la population dans ces zones-là, donc la pression démographique. Alors, une fois ces éléments mis ensemble, cela nous permet de dire est-ce que cette ou telle zone sont favorables à la pratique de l'agriculture urbaine ou périurbaine. Cela nous a permis de déterminer trois zones, de limiter trois zones importantes ici à Abidjan, notamment la zone d'Anyama, au nord d'Abidjan, et puis euh, au nord-ouest, euh, au nord une zone qu'on appelle la zone de Bodumé, et maintenant au niveau du sud-est d'Abidjan, la zone de Bengéville. Ce sont des zones où on trouve de fortes concentrations, bien entendu, du migrant. Ensuite, après cette phase d'identification des zones favorables à ce genre d'agriculture, le projet MITSA a, a lancé un appel à la candidature des projets pilotes pour sélectionner des, des, des projets innovants. Des projets innovants, aujourd'hui, où on parle de lutter contre le changement climatique, on parle d'adaptation, on parle de résilience. Donc, euh, à travers ce projet, ici en Côte d'Ivoire, nous avons sélectionné deux projets qui valorisent l'agriculture verticale, qui valorisent les ordures ménagères, qui, 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 qui permettent de créer autour de la ville d'Abidjan euh, un environnement sain, un environnement vert qui permet de créer, de piéger, si vous voulez, des euh, gaz à effet de serre, et ce qui va permettre à un cadre idéal de vie au niveau des villes qui aujourd'hui sont, euh, sont, très polluées, sont très polluées. Donc voilà un peu euh, ce genre d'agriculture qu'à travers le projet MINSA de l'OIM, ici à Lydian, nous permette de, de vivre sainement dans les villes telles qu'Abidjan. Et nous comptons certainement, après cette phase pilote-là, exporter ces ces projets-là à l'intérieur d'Abidjan et pourquoi pas aux alentours des pays en Côte d'Ivoire, autour, autour de la Côte d'Ivoire, ou les grandes localités que, qui subissent cette pression, qui subissent euh, 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 l'impact du changement climatique parce que l'agriculture à l'intérieur n'arrive plus à approvisionner le marché, le marché des grandes villes, donc notamment à Abidjan, je ne parle pas bien, donc n'arrive plus à approvisionner euh, le marché. Les produits deviennent chers, alors qu'autour d'Abidjan, 
si l'agriculture urbaine et périurbaine arrive à provisionner de façon immédiate les marchés, cela joue sur les coûts notamment. Et bien entendu, nous avons les produits de qualité et des produits frais. Donc, je remercie bien entendu l'OIM à travers ce projet. Je remercie également aussi l'État français qui a pu l'OIM à travers ce projet qui permet à Abidjan de respirer mieux, de vivre bien et, et, et être en synergie, en, 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 je veux dire, en, en sens de vivre ensemble avec les migrants. Je voudrais m'arrêter là et, et, et vous dire merci. Je vous remercie. Merci, monsieur. C'est passionnant aussi de savoir comment vous avez réussi à Abidjan à développer euh, cette convivialité, je dirais, à intégrer les migrants dans des projets euh, novateurs qui favorisent la, la résilience et le savoir vivre ensemble, euh, alors que vous faites déjà face, à la, la Côte d'Ivoire fait face à cette raréfaction maintenant de ressources qui ne permet pas de nourrir complètement la ville, euh, disons, d'Abidjan. On est sur ces, les, les faits de ciseaux de, du changement climatique euh, dans les deux sens. Alors, je voudrais donner la parole, euh, descendre encore plus au sud. I, I'm going to say in, in English because I'm sorry, but our interpreters had to leave. They have another event. And I'm going to speak in English just to give now the, the floor maybe to Lukman, as we haven't heard him up to now. Lukman is from Nigeria. And I would like to know what is your reaction to those different solutions and projects that you've been uh, seeing and which were presented. Do you think they are able to strengthen resilience? Do you think they are uh, impacting the youth? And uh, what would be your, your reaction first and your, maybe your, your, modes of, your words of wisdom? <laughs> thank you. Can you hear me? OK. Um, first, thank you so much for this platform. I'm extremely grateful to be here. And I think that, um, yeah, we have, we have uh, climate changes with everyone. It's staring in our face every day. And I think that building resilience is one of the best way to go. And she, she highlighted it very well. I think that reactionary um, resilience is not really good, rather to be proactive. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, we still have the time to be proactive in our different phases at the moment. So it's not until floods come to our doorstep before we start to take action. I think it is extremely important to be proactive in our resilient effort. Um, that being said, I think that majority of all the projects that I've seen here, I think that it shows the thought process of how um, we are trying to make efforts to get things better. So, which is very important. Um, however, like my colleague said earlier, we must, ask, we must uh, integrate the youth, the young minds at every step, not just at the implementation stage alone, at the planning stage, at the implementation, st implementation stage, and at the stage where we basically want them to, even at the using stage, because at some point, if the co at the community level, if at this project, if they don't understand how it is being used, it will be dormant mm. and it will not serve the purpose. So it is extremely important for people to be integrated. And largely is that um, the youth are extremely important in all this effort, adaptation, resilience, and um, even advocating for, um, for mobility to be a source of um, adaptation the youth are extremely important. And for me, the key highlight is we must build knowledge. Knowledge is at the center of everything. No matter how beautiful the ideas is, no matter the kind of climate finance we get, if we don't have the necessary skills to utilize those funds, if we don't have the necessary skills to even make use of those beautiful projects, it will stay there and it will not serve the purpose. We have seen um, a lot of beauty projects in the northern part of Nigeria, in the southern part of Nigeria, but because there is no enough knowledge for people, they are just dormant. So I think it is extremely important. And when we talk about knowledge, I'm not talking about climate literacy alone. It also means that um, a whole gamut of education needs to be put in place. It helps people understand their environment better. It helps them know how to nurture the environment and how to protect it. 
So I think it is extremely important. And of course, data. Data is just at the center of everything. We must um, um, invest in data, also simplify, because we don't just want to use technical jargon that we have in our scientific knowledge. We must make it easy for an ordinary person, either it is educated or not, mm -hmm. to be able to understand what we are talking about data. So I think it is extremely important. And also, while we are trying to use formal education, we must also incorporate informal education. Because um, I have seen a lot of innovations from most of our colleagues, even youth, trying to develop games. You know, the way we pay, play our drafts, our cards. So, make, so they are inculcating uh, environmental knowledge, climate change knowledge. These are informal way, but mm. it's one way or the other making people to understand the importance of protecting our environment and addressing climate change. So I think this is extremely important as we try as much as possible to address this huge crisis that uh, we hope that it doesn't, uh, we hope that we, we, we get to start acting as much as possible. Um, I won't go back to the innovative side, to the innovation that they have said, but I think that at this art of everything, knowledge is important, data is important. However, mm -hmm. policy is also extremely important. As we are thinking of all these things, we must look at policies that will touch on all these things so that people can start um, being at the center of our policy making on climate solutions. And thanks to the Ministry of um, Environment that they have said earlier, I think that it shows how much the ministry is actually putting people at the center. But it is not enough. We don't emphasize what people need. You actually let them tell you what they need. So it, uh, that means it is a bottom-up approach thing. So, and that makes it extremely important. And I, won't st I would like to stop there. So just to say that um, this is uh, it, it's a work in progress. We are not going to achieve anything, everything at, at once. We just um, need to know that there is a lot of work to do and all hands yeah, must be on deck, including the youth. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this inspiring uh, words. And I do confirm that anyway, at least for, the, for IOM, the approach is to start with the communities, understand, and if necessary, map the community's needs their needs and then we adapt if i can say and propose projects which are adapted to the needs so knowledge is important data for it of course and then the bottom up approach so that then we find solutions together which are adapted to the situation thank you very much and maybe rose will speak about a little bit east africa as we have spoken a lot of west africa tonight and we are going to conclude yeah, I mean, since I already had a chance to talk, I think I'll just say a few things. Nothing is for us without us. Transformative inclusion and collaboration with youth is very key. I'll also say that uh, we need more investments in mm. early prepared preparedness and early warning systems, mm. or else we'll continue having more people being displaced. Uh, so more innovations in that. Uh, and more funding for and capacity building not only as funds or finance or money capacity building in skills in interpretation of data and our for example the organization i started is working on an early warning a digital early warning system so um i'll also say that as activists there's a statement we say that the people united will never be defeated so collaboration is very important mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I guess that is it, since I already had a chance to speak. Very good. No, very good, very inspiring words as well. And uh, United, yes, we try to be and we try to we will keep as well. We will listen to you and to your voices. Thank you very much. Merci de toutes ces uh, présentations très inspirantes de solutions qui sont en marche pour, uh, pour arriver à faire face uh, quand même au changement climatique et à permettre... Uh, aux, 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 aux populations urbaines et périurbaines de vivre mieux en s'adaptant avec des techniques nouvelles, des techniques telles qu'on l'a entendu en termes d'habitat ou d'environnement, de, de, enfin de maîtrise de l'environnement urbain. And thank you very much to our young, our two young uh, activists, as you say, but uh, uh, really uh, nearly political leaders now <laughs> for their inspiring words. 
that we're going to think about. And merci infiniment donc à l'ambassade de France, à la représentation permanente de la France auprès des Nations Unies à Genève pour cette opportunité de, de débat enrichissant et croisant euh, la recherche, les institutionnels et euh, le, regard des, 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 le, le regard pointu, si je peux dire, des gens qui détiennent la science, des, des associations qui se sont investies dans, ces, dans ce domaine et des jeunes. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Caroline. Euh, pour avoir modéré ces, 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 ces panels très, très intéressants. Merci à tous les panélistes. Au revoir et bonne soirée.